wherever you are tuning in, thank you for joining us for the next phase of Axiom Space's AX2 mission on this early morning. <laughs> the AX2 mission is the second all-private crew to the International Space Station dedicated to expanding access to low Earth orbit for all. You're watching the live approach and docking coverage of the AX2 mission as NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom Space begin close proximity operations with the International Space Station. Hello, I am Duke Brady, a multimedia specialist with Axiom Space, and with me is Kate Tice, Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. Our four-person Axiom crew will experience 10 days on orbit, eight days on board the ISS. And this webcast is a joint broadcast between NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom Space as we will walk you through the events of Dragon approaching and docking with the ISS and carry our coverage through to the welcome ceremony that awaits the crew once they are on board the International Space Station. The AX2 mission officially started yesterday, Sunday, May 21st, when the Axiom crew lifted off from historic pad 39A at 2.37 p.m. Pacific, 5.37 p.m. Eastern. The crew inside Dragon spacecraft is now in position to begin approaching the International Space Station. Now let's check in with the teams at Johnson Space Center who are actively monitoring Dragon Freedom's progress. Good morning, Kate and Duke, and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. I'm NASA's Leah Cheshire, and Dragon has been chasing down the International Space Station for almost 14 hours now since that launch yesterday, and we are just seconds away from the approach initiation burn. Now, the approach initiation burn is going to bring Dragon up about 400 meters below the International Space Station, so about a quarter of a mile. And it's also, and we just heard the call, that the AI burn has begun. We're probably going to hear some chatter between the crew and the ground here throughout the morning. The teams here in Mission Control Houston are being led by Flight Director Marcos Flores. Related They're monitoring all, of, state, all space to of these systems aboard the International Space Station. Okay, we'll move into Space Ground 3 then. And to the right of Marcos Flores is our Capcom, Justin Cartledge. He is working with the teams aboard the International Space Station, speaking with the astronauts there. Again, the AI burn is underway. This is a firing of the Draco thrusters on Dragon. It's about a 90-second burn. And it's going to bring this us up now until we're about 400 meters. Suit grounding and audio configuration. Copy that, 4.010 complete. That call from Commander Peggy Whitson aboard Dragon that they are now in their suits and they have good comm checks. And we have confirmation of a good AI or approach initiation burn. Dragon Again, that SpaceX approach on initiation. The big loop. We have nominal AI maneuver completion. Reminder if C2V2 link is lost for 10 minutes without ground action, Dragon will perform a breakout. Timers are, are available in your event details. And Dragon copies. And Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Let's try this again. 144K bidirectional link is established. Change your PTT destination to ISS and then initiate comm check with SpaceX, Houston, and station. Dragon copies on the big loop. Um, so Dragon SpaceX, how do you read? And Dragon, I believe you still have ground set elected to your PTT. And with completion, uh, ground or SpaceX ground, uh, 
Dragon, how do you read us on the big loop? And Dragon SpaceX on Dragon and Ground, um, if you could okay. switch C2 uh, to the key of ISS. Yes, my bad. Uh, SpaceX Dragon on the big loop now for C2. How do you mean? And I have you 5x5 five five on the big loop. And Station Dragon on the big loop. How do you read? Dragon Station has you loud and clear. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Likewise. And Houston Station on the big loop. How do you read? Houston reads you five by five. How many? We have you loud and clear as well. And SpaceX Dragons, Dragon Ground, how do you read? And John, I have you 5x5, five five. how me? Sounds good, thanks. As you can hear, we are up and running this morning. You heard a lot of comm checks when we were uh, discussing the big loop. This is a loop created so that the space station, Dragon, and the teams on the ground in Hawthorne and here in Mission Control Houston can all communicate on the same loop. Our Cronus flight controller set that up this morning. And Dragon that means SpaceX we are on Dragon to ground for suit leak checks. Uh, Dragon, go. Hey, John, you have a go to perform 4.011 to start your suit leak checks. Okay, sounds good. We're going for those suit leak checks. Dragon. The AX2 crew members are already in their suits this morning. And we did, at the start of today's broadcast, just have completion of the approach initiation burn. Dragon is now about 400 meters below the International Space Station. It has also passed into the approach ellipsoid. We call that the AE. That's an imaginary shape measuring a four kilometer by two by two kilometer, uh, essentially a large three-dimensional oval. This means Dragon is on a 24-hour safe on trajectory. Ground, low priority. Uh, Dragon ready. Hey, John, I was just wondering, did that echo resolve itself? Yes, sir, you're crystal clear now. Thank you very much. That's good to hear. Thanks. The crew reported hearing an echo just moments ago uh, before we joined the broadcast today when they had multiple loops set up for communication, but now everyone is established and speaking on the big loop, meaning all teams involved can hear the communication. We are tracking docking to the Node 2 Zenith, or the space-facing port, this morning at the International Space Station at about 8.10 a.m. Central Time, 9.10 Eastern Time. So moving right on time, Now 14 hours and two minutes since launch yesterday afternoon. SpaceX Dragon, Dragon Ground, we're ready to pressurize at two decimals two. And Dragon SpaceX, you are go to initiate suit leak checks. Dragon Cups.
Again, we are here in Mission Control Houston this morning, monitoring Dragons docking to the International Space Station scheduled for 8, 10 a.m. Central Time. But we have teams in Mission Control Hawthorne monitoring Dragons flight since launch yesterday as well. So I'm gonna send it back to Kate and Duke. Awesome, thanks so much, Leah. Uh, we did hear the call out that they got, the crew got the okay to begin the suit leak check. Um, as Leah mentioned before, they donned their suits a little bit ago and that leak check is basically uh, just inflating the suits a little bit and monitoring the pressure for a couple of minutes just to make sure that um, once, now that their suits are back on, all those zippers are in the right place and the visor is latched and locked and uh, ready to approach. <laughs> it's great, it's great to hear all those healthy calm checks yeah. as well. As the Dragon begins its approach to the space station, let's learn a little bit more about the AX-2 crew. The AX-2 mission is commanded by retired NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson. Born and raised in Beaconsfield, Iowa, she was inspired along with the world when she watched the Apollo 11 crew walk on the moon. She has since become the most experienced American astronaut and one of the most decorated. Whitson flew three long duration missions to the ISS and has more cumulative time in space, 665 days, than any US astronaut and more than any woman in the world. She has conducted 10 spacewalks with over 60 hours out in the vacuum of space and has performed hundreds of research experiments on board the ISS. Not only is she the commander for this mission, but Peggy also serves as the director of human space flight for Axiom Space. The pilot for AX-2 is private astronaut John Schaffner. Born in Alaska and raised in Kentucky, Schaffner is a STEAM education advocate, business pioneer, and lifelong space enthusiast. A pilot since the age of 17, John has over 8,500 flight hours holding commercial, instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings in land and sea aircraft, as well as helicopter. He also holds ratings in former military jets and high Santa performance. Six, six, dragon, dragon, ground. We had uh, we show four good suit leak checks here, and ground concurs. All right, good news there. Just letting us know that uh, all the suit leak checks checked out. <laughs> As an athlete, John has years of competitive experience in water skiing, cycling, whitewater kayaking, hang gliding, skydiving, and base jumping. <laughs> John trained as the AX2, excuse me, AX1 backup pilot, and during this mission, plans to invest a lot of his time in STEAM education activities aimed at empowering educators and inspiring teachers. And representing the Saudi Space Commission and serving as a mission specialist, Ali Al Karni was born in March 1992 in Sabt Al Alea, Saudi Arabia. Ali is fluent in English as well as his native Arabic. And as an Air Force captain, Ali has 12 years of experience flying on multiple aircraft, primarily on the F 15 SA in service to the Royal Saudi Air Force. Ali graduated with a Bachelor of Aerospace Science degree in 2013 from King Faisal Air Academy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Also representing the Saudi Space Commission and serving as a mission specialist, Rayana Barnawi was born in September 1988 in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Rayana has a master's degree in biomedical sciences from Al Faisal University in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and a bachelor's degree in biomedical sciences from Otago University in Dunedin, New Zealand. She is fluent in English and Turkish, as well as native Arabic. She has been a research lab technician since 2013 in the stem cell and tissue reengineering program at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center located in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And there you have it, the AX2 crew. This is a fantastic, wonderful group of people who have spent months and thousands of hours preparing for this moment. We are so proud of them, and it's so awesome to finally see them in space. Yeah, we had an opportunity to actually hear from the crew just, I was like about three hours after uh, they made it to, or excuse me, uh, yeah, after they got into space. Um, that uh, in orbit, on orbit media event was awesome. We got to see and hear from Peggy, John, Ali, and Rayana, and it was just so cool to see them floating around and spinning their water <laughs> bottles and playing with the, um, the zero G uh, indicator. And yeah, it was just a lot of fun to see them play. It really was great. 
Now, today's crew, as we said, Peggy Whitson, John Schaffner, Ali Al Carney, and Rayana Barnawi have gone through extensive training around the globe to be ready for their 10 days in space. Each crew member has between 700 and 1,000 logged hours of time since mid-2021 dedicated to learning the SpaceX protocols, ISS systems, and to prepare for the science and outreach activities that they'll be conducting while in space. Private astronaut training is rigorous. To prepare the AX2 crew for their mission, our teams here at SpaceX have spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and running simulations full of missions from inside our Dragon training capsules. The training program includes nearly 100 different lessons covering all, all aspects of the flight. And the list of training goes on. There's a lot more that they did, and we'll try to recap some of it. The AX2 Chris spent time in simulators to orient their bodies to the conditions that may be experienced during the course of the mission, including into a centrifuge right here, simulating higher G-forces. Alternatively, the crew also participated in a zero-G parabola flight that simulated the lack of G-forces to experience weightlessness. Seems awesome. But aside from the simulation, Aside from the simulating gravitational forces they will experience over the course of their journey, they also underwent altitude training in a hyperbaric chamber. This training simulates high altitudes where oxygen levels are low, and the crew uses this to identify how their bodies respond to hypoxic situations, as well as recognizing those effects in their crewmates. To be ready to spend eight days on board and working on the International Space Station, they have spent time learning from mission controllers, experts in safety and emergency ISS procedures, as well as the essentials to living on board the orbiting laboratory. Things like how to heat up your food, where to find all the equipment you need, etc. The goal is to be able to competently, confidently complete every task on their timeline, but to also be contributing members of the space station as a whole as other astronauts carry out their duties. And to that end, this crew will be working in areas on the ISS that are owned and operated by other countries. So the crew traveled to Germany and Japan to be qualified on those systems. The European Space Agency's Columbus module was in Cologne, Germany, where they trained on systems and operations for daily tasks, as well as responding to contingencies. Separately, to qualify for the Japanese Exploration Module, or GEM, the crew traveled to Scuba, Japan, to learn from the instructors from the, Japan, Japan, from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. As you can imagine, international collaboration is a constant throughout this mission. So it's one thing to learn the systems of ISS, but it's just as important to understand how to live and work as a team in a shared space. And so the team spent five days training in the Human Exploration Research Analog, or HERA, at the Johnson Space Center. This is a confined experience that is designed to isolate the crew to build cohesiveness and teamwork. This experience included a chance to simulate work and research procedures, rehearse, rehearse outreach efforts, and even respond to mock emergencies, all while living in close quarters, unable to leave. <laughs> the team also spent time at the launch pad in the suitup room and working through emergency procedures that might be necessary in the unlikely event of a pad abort scenario. That's so. right. That's right. pretty cool to see. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, all of this training culminated in a final patch hanging ceremony at Johnson Space Center to mark the end of this crew's training. This is a tradition of NASA's that dates back to the beginning of the ISS 20 plus years ago. All that is to say this team is ready to go. And the last few months have all led to the here and now. What they accomplish on station is going to help write the guidebook for our next missions and how we coordinate efforts on our future Axiom Station. Needless to say, this is also an important moment for those training crews as really they become a family and feel so connected after all that time together. Now on your screen, we have our first view of Dragon. This view comes to us from the International Space Station. We can see <laughs> the lights blinking, uh, indicating its location. And this is the furthest away it will be on camera. <laughs> so <laughs> it is uh, approaching the International Space Station. For those of you that have just recently joined us, we had confirmation that the crew completed their suit leak checks and those leak checks looked good. So they are in their seats, they're strapped in, um, and they are monitoring the progress of uh, their approach to the International Space Station. This is what traffic looks like at the ISS. <laughs> <laughs> Very true.
There is no doubt that the incredible efforts of thousands of folks across NASA over the last two decades have set the stage for what is possible in low Earth orbit. The X-2 mission is a critical step toward opening those possibilities to a host of new participants, governments, diverse researchers, manufacturers, and more. Here on Earth, we're already seeing benefits from research currently conducted on the ISS, from water and air purification systems to testing medical devices and therapeutics. Pretty amazing stuff. In addition to tech demos and medical research, access to low Earth orbit allows for a connection to the arts and other outreach opportunities. AX-2 is the first of several proposed missions in advance of Axiom Station, the world's first commercial space station. A sustainable commercial low Earth orbit economy means expanded access to work in space. It also frees up NASA and its partners to put their budget towards other exploration programs while granting space agencies around the world more opportunities through commercial efforts. And over its lifetime, the ISS has accomplished an unprecedented feat continuously sustained operations on and off the Earth for more than 22 years. This is not only a true testament to the te technology required to physically achieve that, but also to the collaborative and cooperative efforts of thousands of people across the world to ensure that multiple nations, agencies, and entities, both public and private, work together to push humanity forward. And as we move forward, private industries need, to need time to learn how to reestablish, to establish and maintain these relationships effectively. So by flying private astronaut missions like AX-2 to the ISS, Axiom is taking essential steps to get that on-the-job training as we work towards building the world's first commercial space station. Axiom Station is an opportunity to continue the story of the ISS, science and research, through cooperation and collaboration for the benefit of all. AX2 is this next chapter. So once again, we are observing Dragon Freedom as it approaches the International Space Station. The crew has their suits on, they're in their seats, uh, and they are inside those blinking lights. <laughs> it's, it's so amazing to think about. Now we will see those blinking lights get closer and closer over the next couple of hours. Um, everything uh, when you are approaching or departing the International uh, Space Station is highly choreographed and um, it's, it's really slow and that's for safety purposes. Um, it's the, the, the safer way and the best way to do it. So um, we will see Dragon get closer and closer. I, you know, even those two lights that we see, the red one and the green one, um, they represent the port and starboard side, and I never remember <laughs> what color goes to what, uh, but I can tell you that we will start to see those get closer as we have been, even over the last few minutes. And you might be seeing some stars on your screen, but most of those dots are dead pixels in that camera sensor, and that's, that happens because of that high radiation in space. Now, Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. It is the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth and is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space station. Dragon is fully autonomous, which means that uh, it flies itself, <laughs> but it also features full manu manual override capabilities in case of emergency. Standing at almost 27 feet tall from bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone, Crew Dragon is composed of two main elements, the capsule, which is designed to hold crew and pressurized cargo, as well as an unpressurized section, which is known as the trunk. The nose cone at the top of the capsule protects the docking system and also the guidance navigation control system, which is uh, the system that's being primarily utilized uh, right now as Dragon is approaching the International Space Station. That nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to the space station, excuse me, attached to the Crew Dragon spacecraft, unlike previous versions of Dragon, um, and that helps toward our efforts toward reusability. Now, opposite of the nose cone is the trunk. It provides attachment points for Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and cargo. 
One half of the trunk is covered in solar panels. Um, that's the black side of the trunk on the exterior. And uh, those provide power to Dragon during flight and while on station. The other half contains a radiator and it rejects heat from the active thermal control system to space using SpaceX's new Pika tiling technology. The trunk also now has a new aerodynamic has new aerodynamic fins, which provide stability in the event of an, em an emergency abort. Now, in the event of an emergency abort, Crew Dragon is outfitted with eight Super Draco thrusters, as opposed to the, just the regular Draco thrusters, and those power uh, the astronauts to safety. Dragon Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of Crew Dragon, and it gives the crew the ability to quickly separate from Falcon 9 and safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. It's a feature that no other spacecraft in history has possessed. So it's pretty awesome, and it's um, a, a great safety feature. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. We are actually going to toss back now to Leah at Mission Control at Johnson Space Center. Leah? Thank you both very much. And yes, tally ho, we have sights set on Dragon. Now, as you can see, it is pretty dark outside. That's because the International Space Station is in an orbital nighttime. It's currently flying over the South Pacific Ocean, about 261 miles above Earth. And of course, Dragon is now just slightly below it. Waypoint Zero brought Dragon about or uh, sorry, the approach initiation burn brought Dragon to waypoint zero at 400 meters below the International Space Station. The systems have checked out and it's now moving up toward waypoint one. That is when Dragon is approximately 220 meters uh, above the space station. It'll be on the docking axis, meaning it's directly, directly in front of the docking port. So the crew are headed to the Zenith port, the space facing port of node two. And the other Dragon that's currently on board, which brought the Crew-6 crew uh, earlier this year, that is uh, docked to the forward port of the Harmony module. As you can see, we um, go in and out of receiving feeds from the International Space Station. That happens when we go through satellite handover periods. The International Space Station is orbiting Earth um, and seeing a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. So we constantly hand over to different satellites that receive the feeds from the station and send it back to us on the ground. So you'll see that a little bit this morning. After we reach waypoint one, we will pause until Dragon gets the go to move into waypoint two. That's when they're only 20 meters away from the International Space Station and the spacecraft is focused on aligning its docking system with the International Docking Adapter. Slow and steady wins the race at this point in the mission. Right now we're moving at uh, less than five miles per hour. And as we move in from waypoint two, we'll be moving even slower. We may hear the call out chop at a little less than 30 seconds before docking. That's the crew hands off point when any aborts need to be done automatically by Dragon. And of course we are tracking docking to come in at about 8, 10 a.m. Central time this morning. The crew are in their suits. Uh, they have completed good suit leak checks. Everything continuing to move along very smoothly today. A look back at some of what was completed last night. Shortly after launch, less than an hour after liftoff, at about 5.23 p.m. Central Time, Dragon executed the phase burn. That was the first of the five major burns required to raise Dragon's orbit and position it for approach to the space station. About seven hours later, we had the boost burn. That puts the crew in an orbit where Dragon's apogee, or the highest point, is about 10 kilometers lower than the station. After that, we executed the close co-elliptic burn at 12.51 a.m. Central Time. The close burn puts Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station. That means it is roughly 10 kilometers lower than the station the entire way around the Earth instead of just being 10 kilometers below the station at Apogee or its highest point.
We also saw the transfer burn at about 2.47 a.m. Central Time this morning. That's the fourth major maneuver where we raised Dragon's Apogee again, or the highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers lower than the space station. Dragon, we rounded SpaceX everything out on with the, the big loop. Mid-course burn complete and nominal. Trajectory has converged on waypoint zero. Dragon copies. And we just heard confirmation of a good mid-course maneuver. That's about halfway through the journey to waypoint zero to make sure Dragon is positioned right under the station, again, about 400 meters below. So confirmation that they did indeed conduct a mid-course maneuver this morning and everything continues to look good for Dragon. We are in integrated operations. This happens when Dragon gets closer to the space station, specifically when they enter the approach ellipsoid, that four by two by two kilometer invisible boundary around the International Space Station. This helps us govern all arriving and departing visiting vehicles, whether they carry cargo or crew. We're also hearing good words about teams being go to move inside the keep out sphere. That's another checkpoint that consists of an imaginary sphere around the station with a radius of 200 meters. The keep out sphere carries a similar requirement on the orbital trajectory that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of its thrusters, the space station would be safe for four orbits or about six hours. However, everything looking good on Dragon this morning. Again, we are in an orbital nighttime. This view coming from the International Space Station as we are tracking Dragon and its approach to the orbiting laboratory. Once Dragon arrives at the space station today, they will be greeted by seven crew members currently living on orbit. That includes NASA's Frank Rubio, Steve Bowen, and Woody Hoberg, Sultan al Nayadi of the United Arab Emirates, and Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Patelin, and Andrei Fedyaev. That'll bring our crew up to 11 for the next several days. We are looking at about an eight day docked mission for the AX2 crew, about 10 days in orbit in total. The crew on the International Space Station will be monitoring arrival this morning, specifically Woody Hoberg of NASA and Sultan al Niyadi of the United Arab Emirates will be uh, in the station's cupola using special software to track Dragon's approach and make sure it stays in the expected zones. Once Dragon is docked, Hoberg will be our prime to start those hatch opening operations. He will start by opening the large hatch on the node 2 forward, or node 2 zenith that is, giving him access into the pressurized mating adapter. They'll then pressurize the vestibule, and that's the small space between the hatches on the Dragon and Space Station. Of course, the vestibule is exposed to vacuum prior to docking, Houston, so the crew... on the big loop, Dragon range is approximately 1,000 meters. Monitor long range approach per steps 1 to 4. In 1.102, Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. ISS crew is now primed for vehicle approach monitoring. That call up to the International Space Station, just as we were explaining. They are primed to monitor the arrival of the AX-2 crew today. 
Again, we're heading toward waypoint zero. That's the 400 meters below station mark. We are now 950 meters from station, closing in at about 2.9 miles per hour. So once we dock at approximately 8, 10 a.m. Central Time, it takes about two hours to pressurize the vestibule, the space between the hatches. Flight controllers here in Houston will monitor and verify the pressure readings to make sure that everything is leak-free before we get the ready. Loop for approach setup. Go ahead on the big boot for approach setup. Ground has pulled go for approach zero and will be enabling the maneuver shortly. Expected maneuver start time is per your forward displays. Reminder that Dragon will continue through waypoint one to waypoint two without stopping at waypoint one. We copy, go expected shortly, passing through zero to one. Good to be back. Good news from the ground to the crew, that coming from the core, the crew operations responsible engineer in uh, Hawthorne, California at SpaceX headquarters, to Commander Peggy Whitson aboard Dragon. The team will not have to pause uh, at waypoint one. Sometimes there's a pause associated there so they can check out all systems, but things are looking good this morning to continue through. Dragon now 800 meters away from the space station. The International Space Station crew members have been preparing for arrival of Dragon by moving and setting up some laptops as well as crew alternate sleep accommodations. Again, we will have 11 crew members. Feels like a full house aboard the station once the AX2 crew arrives today. Teams also will do things like feather the solar arrays or maneuver, uh, maneuver them so that they avoid any plumes from Dragon once it gets closer to the station. It's also been a busy time on the space station with another variety of activities, including a port relocation. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Crew-6 crew boarded their Dragon spacecraft and moved it from Zenith, the uh, space-facing port on Node 2, to the forward-facing port. So that is where the uh, AX-2 crew will dock today, to that Zenith port. However, the maneuver was to prepare for the arrival of CRS-28, the 28th uh, commercial resupply mission from SpaceX to the International Space Station. That will bring with it some new solar arrays. Those are called International Space Station rollout solar arrays, and those are stored in the trunk of Dragon. That Zenith port it makes it much easier for the Canadarm2 to help retrieve those irosas uh, for eventual installation on some spacewalks later this year. We've had a handful of spacewalks happen over just the last few weeks at the space station, including three Roscosmos spacewalks to move and connect and deploy a radiator, as well as one NASA spacewalk to... Just reporting per block one vehicle in sight. Houston copies. We have recently had a spacewalk to prepare for those uh, upcoming solar array installations. And hearing confirmation from the crew aboard the International Space Station that they themselves also have their sights set on the approaching Dragon. Ahead of arrival of the crew today, uh, the space station crew are moving through their morning, including preparing the node 2 area for docking and hatch opening, as well as getting the required exercise for the day. 
And here we have a new view of Dragon approaching the space station from the International Space Station itself. Again, we are looking at docking exactly an hour from now at 8.10 a.m. Central Time. This view from the International Space Station while Dragon is still 630 meters away. Again, this is an entirely autonomous flight for Dragon. Uh, the crew aboard has been trained that they can take over if needed. However, things continue to move smoothly this morning. The crew off duty time ended at 5.30 a.m. Central Time. Uh, the crew got suited up so shortly after and the big loop was configured, meaning that team members here in, Haw or here in uh, Houston can speak with teams in Hawthorne as well as on the space station and on Dragon on one big communication loop rather than on various different loops. Being that it is an autonomous flight, uh, NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg and Sultan Anayadi of the United Arab Emirates will be in the cupola just to monitor the arrival of Dragon. They can also send commands to the capsule if needed, uh, but that's not anticipated. Hoberg will then be pr uh, primed for assisting in pressurization of the vestibule and the hatch opening operations. After docking and the welcome ceremony, all crew members will then move into an ISS safety briefing, making sure that they are briefed on um, everything they need to know while living aboard the International Space Station for safety purposes. Of course, they go through a lot of that training here on the ground, but it's a great refresher once they arrive on board in the microgravity environment. You might have seen a little bit of uh, lighting change. We are now entering into an orbital daytime. Again, we see uh, 16 sunrises and sunsets a day aboard the International Space Station, moving at 17,500 miles per hour, giving us an even better view of Dragon as it gets closer, now about 500 meters from the orbiting lab. The space station and Dragon are now flying about 270 statute miles uh, just west of Chile. Again, we're heading toward waypoint zero. That'll be at 400 meters below the space station. We are now at 480 meters below the space station. The crew will not stop at waypoint zero. They will continue to move through. Once they make their way to waypoint one, 
uh, there will be a continued go-no-go no go to allow Dragon to begin its approach to Waypoint 2. That's located inside the keep-out sphere, about 20 meters away from the space station. We do not have to hold at Waypoint 1. Uh, all of the systems have checked out, and so we have that opportunity to continue moving toward Waypoint 2. However, we do conduct a hold at Waypoint 2 just to make sure uh, Dragon is um, completely aligned with the international docking adapter on the Node 2 Zenith, or space-facing port. So at that 20 meter distance, Dragon will slow itself down even further, uh, bringing its approach in and eventually make initial soft contact with the uh, adapter soft capture ring that'll retract and bring Dragon in for the hard capture sequence. Now less than 450 meters away from the International Space Station. Again, we are in integrated operations uh, with teams here in Mission Control Houston monitoring Dragon's approach to the International Space Station along with teams in Hawthorne, California. The crew are in their suits. They had good suit leak checks earlier today. Uh, they also are seated. We have them get in their suits and their seats during dynamic phases of flight. Even though it looks like Crew Dragon is moving slowly, we want to make sure that they are in their suits as a precautionary measure during the docking process. They had an opportunity to get out of those suits, uh, have some free time. As Kate and Duke mentioned earlier, they were able to uh, call down to the ground last night and discuss what it was like to be in microgravity. They also had a chance to get some rest, maybe eat some meals, uh, and then eventually their crew rest time ended at 5.30 a.m. Central this morning. Again, you're watching live coverage of the AX-2 mission, Axiom's second private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. These are not NASA astronauts arriving aboard Dragon today. Uh, one of them, however, is a former NASA astronaut, Peggy Whitson. This is her third spacecraft to fly on. She joins a small elite group of astronauts who have flown on three separate spacecraft. She has flown on the space shuttle on the Roscosmos Soyuz and now on Dragon.
since NASA opened up the space station for commercial activity in 2019, we've continued to work with private industry to prepare for the future of low Earth orbit. And our long-term long goal is to be not just the provider of a low Earth orbit destination, but to be a customer. We want to be one of many customers purchasing commercially owned and operated services. So we need to work together today to ensure this path of tomorrow. Enabling these private astronaut missions helps us to refine and mature any of the processes we need for that future. So our NASA astronauts are working side by side with Dragon private SpaceX and national on the big astronauts. Loop. Approach zero has started and trajectory has converged on waypoint one. Expected arrival at waypoint one is per your four displays. Dragon copies. Again, we have uh, reached waypoint zero, that 400 meters directly below the International Space Station. Coming up, we are going to move from waypoint zero to waypoint one, pausing at that distance of approximately 220 meters, putting Dragon on the docking access, access meaning it's directly in front of the docking port. As mentioned previously, all of the visiting spacecraft take the phased approach to the International Space Station. They stop at predetermined gates for the teams to run quick checks on the vehicle performance before approaching the orbiting lab. When it comes to bringing two spacecraft together, slow and steady wins the race as docking operations require a great deal of precision to make sure we're keeping the spacecraft and the crew safe. So when we say slow and steady wins the race, we're now traveling at less than half a mile per hour. Again, we are in integrated operations during this time, meaning teams from both Hawthorne, Hawthorne on the left of your screen and Mission Control Houston on the right are monitoring uh, Dragon and the International Space Station. Additionally, the Axiom Mission Control here in Houston, Texas as well is continuing to monitor the flight that will remain on console this week. With you on the big loop. Range is 400 and stable attitude as expected. Houston copies. The Axiom team will work with the AX2 crew aboard the space station this week to ensure all of the. Uh, payload operations that they'll be conducting, as well as any of their downlinks with team members on the ground, as well as media and uh, potentially some STEM outlets will be uh, executed smoothly. Again, we are in a satellite handover of the tracking data and relay satellite system. These are uh, tracked throughout uh, the flight. We see this with the International Space Station as well as on Dragon. Multiple different customers around the world use these satellite systems. All seven crew members currently aboard the International Space Station, uh, currently moving about their day, some of them exercising, some enjoying their midday meal. Others are working on various uh, payloads and scientific research aboard the International Space Station. There are some constraints as we move into integrated operations, specifically during docking and once the spacecraft is soft docked, uh, there will be an exercise constraint. 
We don't want any additional loads imparted on Dragon, so any vibrations that be can be caused from using, say, the treadmill uh, or the stationary bicycle, we want to keep that from, uh, again, imparting those additional loads to ensure a safe and smooth docking for Dragon. So the crew will be asked and are not timelined to perform any workout act activities during that time. This view from the International Space Station, currently flying 266 statute miles above uh, the South Atlantic Ocean. Dragon is about 400 meters away from the space station. Again, we reached waypoint zero and have the go to move to waypoint one, which will put us 220 meters from the space station above the docking ax or on the docking axis above the node two zenith port. After we reach waypoint one, we'll move into the keep out sphere. That's the 200 meter uh, sphere with a radius of 200 meters around the International Space Station. Again, this is an invisible boundary, but helps us monitor all vehicles that arrive and depart the orbiting laboratory. For any maneuvers at this point, we are uh, seeing Dragon use its service section Draco thrusters. These each provide 90 pounds of force. There are 12 of those Dracos. Those are only used in the vacuum of space. It's good for these attitude control maneuvers. And those are grouped into four clusters of three thrusters each. On board, Dragon also has Super Dracos. These are only used for pad or ascent abort scenarios. So these are currently disabled. Uh, they are disabled after the ascent portion of the mission. There are also four forward bulkhead Draco thrusters. These are located underneath the nose cone. They're used for larger burns like the deorbit burn. However, we're not looking ahead uh, at that currently. We expect that to come uh, about eight days from now. We are planning for this crew to spend eight days aboard the International Space Station. Also located underneath the nose cone is the docking hatch. Uh, this is the portion that will dock to the International Space Station and the hatch that crew members will use to float in and out of Dragon. This is in contrast to the side hatch that the crew used to board the spacecraft yesterday uh, that they will also use to uh, depart the spacecraft after splashdown and being pulled aboard the SpaceX recovery ship.
pretty quiet here in Mission Control Houston, as well as uh, obviously aboard Dragon and the International Space Station, as this is a fully autonomous flight, and everything continues to go well for Dragon and its arrival this morning. Again, Dragon has reached waypoint zero and is making its way to waypoint one, 220 meters above the International Space Station and its intended destination this morning, which is the space facing uh, hatch on node two. So with that, I'm gonna send it back over to Hawthorne for a status update, Kate and Duke. Thanks, Leah. Continuing to follow Dragon's progress as it gets closer and closer to the International Space Station, we're now just 0.45 kilometers away from the ISS. And as Leah mentioned, from multiple locations, uh, this is Johnson Space Center located in Houston, Texas. Um, this mission control room is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, team members are trained in a variety of disciplines and monitor all station systems. In addition to this control room, we have the uh, mission control room here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. That's the view there on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, that is where our teams are monitoring Dragon and checking in on all of its systems. And then of course, the, the Axiom control room on the right-hand side. Yeah, yeah, right there for Axiom Space. Uh, our team is there at mission control in Houston as well. Uh, it's pretty, Fantastic, from this secure facility, we have live access to all the voice, video, and data uh, from the ISS and can work alongside uh, their NASA counterparts to run on-orbit operations and monitor every aspect of the mission in real time. It's led by what we call our, our AXEL, or our Axiom Operations Lead, and there are various positions around the room for research, communications, medical, integration, stowage, timeline operations, et cetera. It's a pretty uh, significant step in our journey as a company to expand access to low Earth orbit as it's on the only, only the 12th ground segment partner for the ISS program. So through this facility, we are enabling our customers in the global community a front row seat to the work being done on station. So as you can see, lots of people uh, supporting this mission from all different locations. It really is a team effort uh, to execute these integrated operations uh, successfully. And part of the reason is, as you can see, it's not just the four crew members that are inside Dragon Freedom right now approaching the space station. Um, it's the whole integrated International Space Station team as a whole. Once the AX2 crew arrives on station, there will actually be 11 crew members total. Um, and it, it's gonna be pretty exciting. Like Leah said, <laughs> a full house. Um, and, but the AX2 crew is going to be super busy. They have a lot of science and research planned and they will also be contributing to the station um, as well as the other crewmates that are, are up there with them. Absolutely, this crew has a very full schedule while on station. And actually a lot of that time will be focused on some pretty fascinating efforts. For the sake of this conversation that we'll have right now, the science that they're doing is organized into a few categories like life sciences, physical sciences, tech demonstrations, et cetera. So with physical science, this includes some radiation protection research as well as some storm related research, um, helping to create rain, cloud seeding, really fascinating stuff like that, and as well as enhance our understanding of dangerous thunderstorms. There's actually a phenomenon called transient luminous effects, which are upper atmospheric lightning or ionospheric lightning. And it's awesome that that, that research could potentially help 
operations at Kennedy Space Center. As we saw yesterday, there was an anvil cloud rolling in, and um, <laughs> you know, I, it's really interesting how this research that the AX2 crew will do could potentially feed back into space operations on the ground. <laughs> Absolutely, a very full circle moment right there. So by the time we're launching AX3, we will have those data back and we'll be ahead of the game. Uh, so on the tech side of research being conducted, this crew will also demonstrate ways to automate some of the tasks that take up precious crew time, things like transferring data or tracking where supplies and materials are on board the space station. There's also an effort to make communicating with Earth easier. So at the heart of Axiom Space is the mantra to build history, to expand access to low Earth orbit for all. And so we're dedicated to creating partnerships with companies that you wouldn't typically expect to hear about going to space to grow the volume of those who can conduct meaningful research and research on board and outreach as well about science and everything else included in that. So a lot going on up there and they're certainly gonna hand their hands full once they dock, which we should be seeing shortly here. Yeah, we're very much looking forward to it. Uh, look at this, this is our first view inside right. the Dragon capsule. I love this view. So on the left hand side would be our commander Peggy Whitson and on the right hand side of that view was uh, pilot John Schaffner. Now this view is also very cool because this is looking at the International Space Station from the Dragon. What a great shot. Yeah, it's just incredible that we can get these live views and see what Dragon is seeing as it is, as it is approaching the ISS. I love living in the future. <laughs> <laughs> like we've mentioned before, we are heading to the Node 2 Zenith port this morning. We have passed through Waypoint Zero, which is the 400 meter mark, um, which is 400 meters away from station. We're heading up and around over the station to Waypoint One, which is about... Dragon Station on the big loop. Expect reconfiguration of the C2V2 return link shortly. Dragon copies. Station copies. So that was SpaceX core David Huang just letting the crew know um, of this upcoming event referring to C2V2, which is the common communication for visiting vehicle. Um, and that's basically just the link for the uh, visiting vehicle, in this case, Dragon Freedom. But yeah, this view um, is over the shoulders of our commander and pilot. And I love that you can see what they're seeing um, in the center. We can see that they are following along um, with the upcoming events. The views on the far left and far right panel um, will illustrate which thrusters are firing when. Um, so I don't really see any, oh, we can see some, uh, a little bit of light flashing. So if you look at the, the far left panel and the upper right hand corner, we saw um, some illumination there indicating that the Draco thrusters uh, were firing. And one thing that I love about our views as we get closer to the International Space Station, the views that we will get from the ISS looking at Dragon, we should actually be able to see those Draco thrusters firing as Dragon is autonomously steering itself toward that Zenith port. Now, when we say autonomous, it's truly what that means. Dragon is doing all the calculations and, 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 and steering and flying uh, automatically. It is flying itself. That being said, um, our pilot, John Schaffner, has the capability to take over manual control at any time if necessary. But it is incredible to be able to see what they're seeing. Oh, in that view on the left-hand side there, we can actually see those thrusters, as I mentioned. It almost looks as if Dragon is like spitting out a little bit, and uh, it's just really cool to be able to see uh, that propulsion system in action as Dragon is flying itself to that Zenith port. And I love it with those two views that we just had <laughs> because it's
dragon looking at station as well as station looking at dragon, which always <laughs> kind of reminds me of the, uh, the Spider-Man meme oh, of yeah. them pointing at each other. <laughs> it's a very meta moment. Mm -hmm. In that image on the right, you see our commander, Peggy Whitson, on the left, pilot John Schaffner on the right, and out of frame, our mission specialist, Rihanna Barnawi and Ali Alkarni. Likely also monitoring all these events. Everyone is, everyone on board this Dragon is probably very, very anxiously awaiting this moment of docking. Ending nearly a 16 hour transit to get to the ISS after launching. Now we are roughly 20 minutes away from hitting that approach one, uh, or excuse me, that, that waypoint one, uh, which like I mentioned before is 220 meters away from the International Space Station. And we can see that the crew has their visors up. Uh, we don't require them to put their visors down until um, they're closer to the space station uh, for that docking procedure. So they're still hanging out, uh, continuing to monitor Dragon's progress. As we said before, once the four Axiom 2 crew members get on station, um, they're going to be there for eight days, uh, and they're going to be very busy. <laughs> when you're on station, your schedule is packed with science and research, sleeping, your, your sleep periods are, are scheduled to ensure that everybody's getting appropriate rest, um, your meal times, and then of course you have to build in some exercise time as well. But yeah, the crew will be uh, very busy once they get on station. So these final moments before they actually arrive um, might actually be <laughs> very calm <laughs> and restful because the, like we said before, the, the crew right now, they are monitoring, they are keeping an eye on Dragon systems, uh, and of course, keeping in contact with the integrated operations teams from uh, all three mission control centers that we mentioned before. Once again, this is a live view of the International Space Station from Dragon. It almost looks fake. <laughs> it's so uh, clear and beautiful. As we get closer, you should be able to uh, make out more clearly the various vehicles that are uh, docked with the International Space Station. Once we get closer, I uh, definitely want to keep an eye on to, to those various ports. As we mentioned, we did a port relocation maneuver for the Crew-6 capsule. Um, Dragon Station on the Big Loop, C2V2 link reconfiguration complete. Dragon copy, C2V2 config complete. As I mentioned, we did a port relocation maneuver for the uh, Crew-6 capsule, which is Dragon in Denver. It was relocated to the Node-2 forward port, uh, and we should be able to see that as we get closer. And I just love it when there is a Dragon capsule getting a view of another Dragon capsule <laughs> <laughs> that is on station. We had that view um, during the Crew-6 docking, if I remember correctly. So this is a live view coming to us from the International Space Station to, or, or of Dragon uh, Freedom as it approaches. All right, so as we are continuing to get, uh, uh, get closer to the International Space Station, we are heading towards that waypoint one. Let's check back in with Leah over at Johnson Space Center to hear how things are continuing to progress with the International Space Station's preparation for Dragon Freedom.
Hi, Kate. Hi, Duke. Thanks for carrying us through a little bit of that. And uh, yes, that's no moon. That is Dragon approaching the International Space Station. As you heard, uh, we've reached waypoint zero, that 400 meters away from the space station. We're just a little bit below that now. Um, but as you can see, we've made quite a bit of movement. Um, our recent, our previous view of Dragon had the Earth in the background. Now we have space in the background. The spacecraft has moved out in front of the International Space Station, still uh, less than 400 meters away, about 380 meters right now, but we're moving up to waypoint one. And again, waypoint one is about 220 meters away from the space station. It'll be directly above that node two zenith or space facing port. Uh, we will, we have the opportunity to pause here, uh, check out any systems if needed, and we expect arrival at waypoint one in about 10 minutes. Once Dragon reaches waypoint one, the next stop is waypoint two. That is only 20 meters away from the International Space Station. So that's when we hope to get that crystal clear view of Dragon Freedom and its four crew members inside. We do conduct a hold at waypoint two. This is to make sure that we are properly aligned with the docking target on node two, also known as Harmony. After reaching waypoint two, Dragon will slowly but surely move in and dock with that port, uh, conducting a soft capture first before the hooks begin to drive and complete a hard capture. Then it takes about two hours until Dragon hatches are ready to be opened and the four new crew members make their way aboard the space station. now 350 meters away from the station. Again, this is Dragon Freedom. It was named that by the Crew 4 crew that visited the International Space Station. Spacecraft keep their names uh, after being named by the crew, so this one uh, will always carry the name Freedom regardless of who's flying on board. On the International Space Station side, things continue to move smoothly. Again, we have NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg in the cupola along with UAE astronaut Sultan Al Niyadi. They're monitoring Dragon's approach. It is a fully autonomous flight for the visiting spacecraft, meaning uh, there is no action required on part of the crew. However, they do have the ability to take control if needed, um, as well as the crew aboard the space station can send commands to Dragon to retreat if necessary. But we're not expecting any of that this morning as things continue to move smoothly, now 330 meters away from the orbiting laboratory. On the space station side, the solar arrays have been configured. Again, uh, teams here in Mission Control Houston will command the solar arrays into a position. We call it being feathered. This keeps any loads from being imparted on the solar arrays themselves from any plumes that come from Dragon as it makes those fine-tuned maneuvers. We are in a satellite handover again with the tracking data and relay satellite systems, but a great shot here of Mission Control at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. Again, we are in integrated operations now that we are inside the approach ellipsoid, that four kilometer by two by two kilometer uh, invisible, invisible oval that helps us monitor all of the arriving and departing spacecraft at the International Space Station. And on the right hand side of your screen, you've got Mission Control Houston. These teams work uh, around the clock, 24 seven, to monitor all of the station systems. Leading the teams this morning is Flight Director Marcos Flores. And communicating with the astronauts aboard the International Space Station is CAPCOM or Capsule Communicator Justin Cartledge. On the left now, you can see the Axiom Space Flight Control Room. They are monitoring the flight as well. They'll remain on console this week to help the crew members execute all of the uh, research and the uh, payload work that they have planned. Additionally, they'll be conducting several downlink events with various uh, media and other STEM organizations here on Earth.
now just 290 meters away from the space station and closing in. Again, slow and steady. We are less than one mile per hour as we uh, see Crew Dragon move toward the International Space Station Zenith port. Once we reach that, it'll be waypoint one. We hope to see that in about five minutes. And we're tracking docking again this morning at 8.10 a.m. Central Time, so just about 20 minutes from now. So look back at what has brought Dragon to this point. Uh, less than an hour after liftoff last night at about 5.23 p.m. Central Time, Dragon executed the phase burn. This was the first of those five major burns. Uh, this raised Dragon's orbit using the Draco thrusters. And about seven hours later, we had the boost burn. This put our crew in an orbit where Dragon's apogee, or the highest point of its orbit around the Earth, is 10 kilometers lower than the space station. After that, we execute the close co-elliptic burn, and this puts Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the station. So it means it maintains that orbit about 10 kilometers lower than the station all the way around instead of just at apogee. The transfer burn occurred at about 2.47 a.m. this morning, Central Time. This is where we raise Dragon's apogee again. That's the highest point of its orbit to just 2.5 kilometers lower than the station. We want to make that co-elliptic one more time, so we round that out with the final co-elliptic burn. That was at 3.34 a.m. Central this morning, maintaining the constant orbit about 2.5 kilometers below the station. We also saw the approach initiation burn just at the start of today's broadcast. This really begins the final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the station, and we started integrated operations between the Dragon control team in Hawthorne and the space station flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston. This uh, approach initiation brought us up to waypoint zero. Waypoint zero is 400 meters below the station. This is the first checkpoint during the approach. We have now entered the approach ellipsoid, uh, that first boundary of monitoring the uh, arrival and departure of visiting vehicles. Of course, we didn't even have to hold at that 400 meters. All of the systems checked out, and Dragon has continued its approach to waypoint one. This happens when we are about 220 meters away from the space station. We're currently 240 meters away, so we're getting very close, and that 220 meters at waypoint one uh, puts us on the docking axis, meaning it's directly above the docking port. So we're heading toward the zenith port of the International Space Station node 2 module, also known as Harmony. Currently docked to the forward port, we have uh, Dragon Endeavor, which brought the Crew 6 crew. So once Dragon is Dragon only 20 station meters on away... The big loop. Approach 1 and soft capture ring extension will begin shortly. Dragon will continue approach to waypoint 2. Reminder that manual impulsive retreat recovery is not permitted. Dragon copies. Station copies. and confirmation that the spacecraft has arrived at waypoint one. Again, we have the opportunity to hold here. It's 220 meters away from the International Space Station, specifically uh, in line with the docking axis on the uh, zenith port of node two. And you can see some of those thruster plumes coming from Dragon as it fine tunes its approach using those service section Draco thrusters.
a great view of those thrusters firing on Dragon as we are at waypoint one, 220 meters away from the International Space Station, specifically directly above the space station. And inside Dragon right now, we have our four private astronauts, uh, Peggy Whitson, the commander, pilot John Schaffner, Rayana Banawi, and Ali Arkhan. With you on the big loop. At prime range 208 meters and decreasing attitude as expected. We copy and concur from the ground. Beautiful view for a moment there. Uh, we have of Dragon, this courtesy of Cronus. Uh, Cronus flight controller here this morning is Brian Crisp in Mission Control Houston. Dragon's thrusters continue to fire. We are now less than 200 meters away from the space station. We have passed through waypoint one as well as the keep out sphere. And the keep out sphere is that uh, 200 uh, meter radius around the International Space Station, another invisible boundary that helps us monitor our arriving and departing vehicles. The next pause for Dragon will be at waypoint two. This is a hold point that's 20 meters away from the International Space Station when we move in toward final docking. In this view of Dragon Freedom, you can see the hatch or the nose cone is opened uh, and a good view of those four forward bulkhead uh, thrusters. Those are used for the larger burns. We are now using the 12 service section Draco thrusters. These are for more fine-tuned fine -tuned attitude maneuvers, especially as we get closer to the International Space Station. The nose cone protects those thrusters as well as the docking uh, mechanisms aboard Dragon. We're expecting arrival at waypoint two in about eight minutes. And again, looking for docking this morning at approximately 8.10 a.m. Central Time. Dragon Freedom is now 164 meters away from the International Space Station. So while we are moving less than one mile per hour, we are continuing to close in on the destination for the AX-2 crew. Dragon on the big blue, visors are closed for all four kids. Copy, Dragon, visors are closed. As we've mentioned earlier, the AX-2 crew are in their suits and in their seats. We got that view over their shoulders this morning. They do not have to wear their suits for the entirety of the flight. When they are not in these uh, dynamic operations periods, they are welcome to take those out, take those off and get into some more comfortable uh, attire specifically for their sleep portion of their flight. However, now they are in their suits. They've conducted suit leak checks uh, through the umbilicals that connect to the spacecraft itself. These also provide communications um, and cooling for the astronauts. And as you heard Commander Peggy Whitson just report down to the ground, uh, the visors have been closed on the suit, so they are preparing for docking. And again, we're looking for that about 10 minutes from now. Uh, we do have some time and some hold time that we can conduct at waypoint two if needed. We can wait until lighting conditions are preferred for Dragon to move in for its final docking.
Once Dragon flies in and makes contact with the International Docking Adapter, we will have soft capture. This is when the soft capture ring retracts and sensors will indicate it's time for 12 hooks to drive in place. Once those hooks have fully driven, we'll have hard capture and that firmly secures Dragon to its new home on the space station. Now just 130 meters from the International Space Station, everything continuing to move smoothly for Dragon. Sensation on the big loop, our review of steps five and six is complete and ISS is ready for docking. Houston copies. We are in another satellite handover and expect to regain video of the crew aboard uh, Dragon as well as from the International Space Station shortly. However, things Dragon continue to check out here. Soft capture ring extension complete. Dragon copies. Station copies. Station Houston on the big loop. At waypoint two, Dragon will briefly pause to align for docking, then automatically resume approach. We are less than 100 meters from the International Space Station. Currently, Flight Director Marcos Flores here in Mission Control Houston is polling all of the team members in this room, conducting their go-no-go -no -go poll for docking. Just heard confirmation Dragon that station Mission Control on Houston the is go. Confirm crew readiness for final approach. Ground has pulled go for approach two and will be commanding approach allowed shortly. As a reminder that once Dragon is inside the crew hands-off point, retreat and breakout are not permitted. And the Dragon 2 is ready to is go for docking and we copy on the uh, crew hands-off point. Crew copies, and we are ready for final approach. A lot of voices in the mix there, the last one being from NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg, who's in the cupola monitoring docking this morning. And good words from all of the teams that they are go for docking. Dragon is now less than 60 meters away from the International Space Station. We're expecting arrival at waypoint two in two minutes. Again, that'll be the 20 meters away from the International Space Station, directly above the Node 2 Zenith docking, act, or docking port. They, we do have a pause at waypoint two and they can hold there for um, an extended period of time if need be, if they want to wait for lighting conditions to change um, or to check out systems any further. However, things continuing to look good this morning. Currently, the International Space Station and Dragon are flying 262 statute miles over Russia in an orbital nighttime.
Dragon now 34 meters away from the International Space Station. We also heard confirmation earlier uh, from teams here on the ground that the soft capture ring is properly extended. This will be the first step in the docking process. Dragon will make contact with the International Space Station and that docking ring, or the soft capture ring will retract, pulling it in until it's time for the uh, two sets of six hooks, so 12 hooks in total, to uh, make the hard capture to the International Space Station. Standing by for arrival at waypoint two. Dragon Freedom and the AX-2 crew have arrived at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters from the International Space Station. Teams here are all on the ground are all go for docking as well as aboard the International Space Station and Dragon itself. Again, this graphic, just a look at what we have seen so far uh, most recently this morning when Dragon arrived at waypoint zero, 400 meters away from the space station, moving into waypoint one, 220 meters directly above uh, and on the docking axis. We have now moved down from that 220 meters in to just two 20 meters from the International Space Station, directly above the Node 2 Zenith port. This is a hold point station for Dragon. Houston on the big loop. Dragon is on final approach and is go for docking. Monitor per steps five and six in one decimal one zero two. Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. Copies didn't work. Again, we do not have video feed from the International Space Station or Dragon at this time, uh, but teams continue to monitor its approach to the space station itself. We have now left that waypoint to hold point of 20 meters away, now about 16 meters from the International Space Station. Dragon Freedom and the AX2 crew now moving at 0.2 miles per hour. All four crew members suited and in their seats preparing for docking. meters. Copy, 10 meters. As you can hear, the uh, Dragon crew are able to view the status of their docking on the uh, crew display screens, reporting that they are now 10 meters and actually less than 10 meters away from the Node 2 Zenith or space facing port on the International Space Station. Five meters. 
Copy, five meters. Still moving 0.2 miles per hour. Dragon Freedom is now five meters away from the International Space Station. Again, we do not have video feed of the spacecraft at this time, but team members are able to track its status and everything continues to go as planned. The crew is now three meters from the space station. Two meters, stop. Copy, two meters. Off. CHOP stands for the crew hands off point, now two meters from the station. Standing by for docking. One meter. Copy, one meter. Soft capture confirmed. And we have confirmation that the Axiom 2 crew has docked to the International Space Station at 8.12 a.m. Central Time. That soft capture ring now beginning to retract and pull Dragon in toward the International Space Station. Docking coming as the space station itself was flying 262 statute miles northeast of Japan. And correction on last, we're still waiting on attenuation. Continuing to get good reports here from teams on the ground. Again, aboard the International Space Station, NASA's Woody Hoberg and UAE's Sultan Al Nayadi continued to monitor the crew as well. After soft capture is complete, those 12 hooks will begin to drive and pull Dragon uh, securely, firmly securing it to uh, the Node 2 Zenith port. And Dragon, now we have ring retraction in progress. Dragon copy. That's the softest docking I've ever had. Good words from commander of the AX-2 mission, former NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson, now flying her third spacecraft after having flown the space shuttle, a Roscosmos Soyuz, and now a SpaceX Dragon. That soft capture ring continues to retract. Again, this is the first stage in docking. Uh, shortly after ring retraction is complete, we will move into the hard docking portion. This is when those 12 hooks, two sets of six, drive um, and firmly secure the spacecraft to the Node 2 Zenith port. Again, just a few weeks ago, the Node 2 Zenith port was occupied by another SpaceX Dragon. Uh, Dragon was relocated by the Crew-6 crew who arrived on that spacecraft from the forward port, or from the Zenith port where uh, Dragon Freedom now is, to the forward port. Again, we expect the Axiom-2 crew to live and work aboard the International Space Station for about eight days before beginning their return journey to Earth.
Ring retraction complete. Docking sequence is holding for MCS reconfiguration. We have confirmation that the ring retraction is complete. Next steps for uh, this hard capture will be for those 12 hooks to drive. In, in addition to the ring retraction and these uh, hooks driving, an umbilical will also be connected from Dragon to the International Space Station. This will allow power to flow from the space station to Dragon itself so that Dragon is no longer relying on battery power, uh, that power being gathered from the solar cells around the base of its trunk. Again, we are in a handover of our satellites uh, for KU, which is what brings down our video. We do have audio communication with the crew through our S-band. MCS configured, proceeding with hook driving. Teams reporting that we are properly configured for hard capture. Uh, again, this is 12 hooks, two sets of six. They will drive the first six, uh, and those are firmly latched. They will then drive the next six. Uh, we do see those first six hooks now starting to drive. The first six hooks continue to drive in the hard capture process. Again, after these, we'll have another set of six before we can officially declare that Dragon is uh, firmly secured to the International Space Station. Everything continuing to go as planned this morning. Again, docking coming at 8.12 a.m. Central Time. We have confirmation that the first set of six hooks have now closed and the second set are driving.
Again, this view from Mission Control Houston as teams are monitoring the docking of Dragon Freedom to the uh, no Again, to Zenith on or Space the big loop on behalf of the Expedition 69 crew. Peggy, welcome back. John, welcome to the International Space Station. And Ali and Rihanna, Ahalan wa Sahalan. Thank you so much for the EXT crew. We're really looking forward to working with you guys this week. Likewise, we'll see you guys very soon. And we have confirmation the second set of hooks has closed um, from Dragon on the International Space Station, meaning hard capture is complete. Dragon Station, hard capture complete. Dragon copy. And with that call... Hard capture is complete. Dragon is firmly attached to the International Space Station. It's home for at least the next eight days. NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg on the space station side will now move into preparing uh, the uh, hatches for opening. Again, that takes about a two hour process. The vestibule needs to be pressurized, the area in between the space station and Dragon. Coming up, the AX2 crew will have the chance to doff or take off their spacesuits, uh, maybe get into their flight suits before they float aboard and we begin our welcome ceremony. And Dragon SpaceX docking sequence complete. Crew Dragon Freedom, Peggy, John, Ali, Ray, congrats on this historic achievement. Welcome to the International Space Station. Great, we really appreciated flying with SpaceX. It was a lovely ride, and as I mentioned, it was the softest docking I've ever felt. Very well done. Thanks to everyone for getting us this far. Thanks, Peggy. We do aim for excellence, and on behalf of SpaceX, it's been a pleasure working with you. And just a little bit of trivia for you, this was the fastest launch to dock time for a Crew Dragon, beating our previous record from Crew 4 by just nine minutes. Ground will be enabling hardline power and comm connections shortly, and you are good to dock suits per procedure 4.012. Ground will be taking cameras external. Copy, 4.012, in work.
Dragon on Dragon to ground. No response required. Cameras are external. Now that all the hooks have driven and the soft capture ring has been stowed, docking is officially complete. The crew is go to doff their suits. Uh, that's why the teams on the ground have told them that the cameras are um, not live at this time inside the cabin. Again, we still do not have um, video from the International Space Station at this time. It looks like we'll regain shortly. The space station itself is in an orbital nighttime. Now flying 261 statute miles over the Pacific Ocean. Again, docking this morning at 8.12 a.m. Central Time. As noted by SpaceX, the fastest docking on record for um, a crew launch to the International Space Station on Dragon. We also have confirmation that the umbilicals have uh, attached from Dragon to the International Space Station. Again, these allow power to flow from the space station to Dragon, as well as data and other telemetry. When in free flight, Dragon uses power gained from its solar arrays uh, and is stored and used from batteries aboard the spacecraft. So connecting to these umbilicals allows it to rely on power generated from the space station. We'll stay live now that we have docked until our welcome ceremony, standing by for the start time for that ceremony. But this hatch open process takes about two hours. A look ahead at the steps that will be uh, happening over the next couple of hours. Again, Woody Hoberg, NASA astronaut on the space station, is prime for these um, operations and bringing the AX2 crew on board. Now that we're docked, he is securing some hardware and then we'll move into hatch operations. First, he will open the large hatch at node 2 zenith that will give him access inside the pressurized mating adapter. He will then help pressurize the vestibule. That's again the small space between the hatches on Dragon and the space station. Of course, this was previously exposed to a vacuum prior to docking. We need to fill it with air, make sure its pressure is nearly equal with the atmospheric space pressures space on Dragon and the station. Uh, Tom, check on the cabin mic. Mic. And Dragon SpaceX, I had you 5x5 five five on the cabin mic, but I am seeing that you have both ground and ISS set to PTT. Please set it to only the big loop. Okay, on the big loop, cabin mic set uh, from Dragon. And I have you 5x5, five five. how me? 5x5, five five, thanks. station. 
Division on two for PMA three ingress part uh, step one. Houston is with you on two. All right, just looking for your go in step one decimal one. Stand by one, and we are checking on that now. Station copies. As you heard, teams on the ground communicating with the crew still aboard uh, Dragon Freedom. Peggy Whitson took a chance to test out the cabin mic rather than the microphones they'd been Station using Houston in their seats. On the now big that loop. You are go those. for one decimal one, a procedure two decimal one zero two. Happy go in step one decimal one of two decimal one zero two. And that voice being uh, NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg communicating with Justin Cartledge here on the ground, his CAPCOM, the capsule communicator. That's the person speaking with the astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Woody is now stepping through some procedures, including um, he will get access inside the pressurized mating adapter and then pressurize the vestibule. We want to make sure the pressure is almost equal with the pressures on board Dragon and the station. He'll use a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the vestibule. Flight controllers here in Houston will monitor the pressure and temperature readings inside and verify that everything is leak-free before we get ready to open the hatches. Again, it's about a two-hour process to get everything pressurized and checked out before we open the hatches. And following that hatch open, we'll have a welcoming ceremony with all four AX2 astronauts, as well as our seven crew members living aboard the station. So if uh, it's not too early for you to do some math, yes, that is 11 people that'll be living aboard the International Space Station for at least the next week. Station node two overhead hatch open. Houston copies. Again, we are live covering the arrival of the AX-2 crew to the International Space Station. This is the second private astronaut mission uh, that has visited the International Space Station following Axiom-1 flight last year. Our crew members aboard Dragon Freedom today include Commander NASA, former NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson. Up until now, she has spent 665 days in space, so she's looking to add to that total. It's more than any U.S. astronaut and more than any woman in the world. She's joined by pilot John Schaffner. And the two mission specialists representing the Saudi Space Commission are Ali al Karni and Rihanna Barnawi. 
on two, we're ready for step two decimal two on your go. Checking. You are go at two decimal two. Copy go. As we hear NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg stepping through the procedures with the grounds go, uh, he will begin pressurizing the vestibule shortly. In the meantime, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio continues to conduct some hardware servicing on the space Dragon, station. SpaceX on the big loop, if desired, reference procedure 4.400 for monitoring vestibule pressurization. Confirmation from teams on the ground that vestibule pressurization has begun. Again, this is the small space between the uh, the Dragon hatch and the space station hatch. We want to bring that up from vacuum to about 14.7 psi. That's about the same pressure as the International Space Station. Approximately the same pressure we're used to here on Earth. Astronauts on the space station live in a mixed nitrogen oxygen environment. Again, very similar to what we have on Earth. And Dragon Station on the big loop, no response required. ISS power connection established. Station on two, step two decimal four, A pass pressure equalized at 1339 GMT. Houston copies You can see some movement, um, and we have our view back of Dragon.
as we see a sunrise in the background, this view of Dragon Freedom with the AX-2 crew aboard docked to the Node 2 Zenith port on the International Space Station. Again, that docking coming at 8.12 a.m. Central Time. The crew inside are now out of their suits. They are preparing for ingress to the International Space Station. Again, this is a process though, so we are uh, pressurizing the vestibule, the space between the two spacecraft. And if you see some color changes, that's because the International Space Station and Dragon are now flying into an orbital sunrise. They are 268 statute miles over the South Pacific Ocean. Now that they're docked, these two will travel 17,500 miles per hour together seeing 16 sunrises and sunsets a day, so the AX-2 crew is certainly in for a treat for their planned eight-day stay. Here in Mission Control Houston, teams are handing over from the Orbit 1 shift to the Orbit 2 shift. We have had Marcos Flores as our flight director this morning. Uh, he will be handing over to Vincent Laporte. Again, Woody Hoberg aboard the International Space Station is leading the team's... Freedom, uh, Houston, stand by for hardline audio config. Freedom is stand by. NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg working to um, pressurize the vestibule, the space between the hatches. Again, this takes about an two hours before the crew members float aboard uh, the International Space Station. All four Axiom 2 crew members still in Dragon Freedom, as you see there, docked to the Node 2 Zenith port. Once they float aboard, they will conduct a welcome ceremony with all crew members before heading into a safety briefing. These private astronauts trained for many uh, contingency scenarios down here on the ground, but the teams aboard the International Space Station will help show them uh, different locations and procedures now that they are on orbit.
Later today, the Dragon Freedom crew will work to transfer some cargo from Dragon to the International Space Station. Uh, that includes some of the scientific research they'll be doing this week, as well as hardware or food needed. Freedom Houston on the big loop for a comp check. Hardline audio configuration is complete. Freedom has you loud and clear on the big loop hardline. Good news. and Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, permission to come on board with cameras.
Pete come on board now, but we'll probably have to ask you to go away again in a little bit. Welcome aboard. Copy that. Uh, we'll keep on exterior until you're ready. Okay, thank you. Recently, you heard a call from Mission Control in Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters, uh, checking with the crew to see if they could turn cameras on on the spacecraft. They'll hold off for a little bit longer on that. But we still have all four crew members aboard. It has now been uh, 41 minutes since they docked to the Node 2 Zenith port, making their official arrival at the International Space Station. On the space station side, NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg is preparing the APAS hatch for opening. And SpaceX Dragon on the big loop, just to let you know, we've got all four, four suits drying. The shortest timer is at passing seven minutes right now. Copy all, four suits drying, and seven minutes have elapsed. And Dragon, with suits drying, I can give you a go for sections one through three of four decimal four hundred. Copy one through three of four decimal four hundred. Again, you're watching live coverage of the AX2 crew arrival at the International Space Station. The crew docked uh, Dragon Freedom to the Node 2 Zenith facing port this morning at 8.12 a.m. Central Space Time. And that this is the way for food inventory and water inventory. Copy that, Ray. Ray to copy for inventory. Three, five bottles, 207, four bottles. Four food, 305, one meal and a snack. Three, 13, one meal and a snack. 307, one meal and a snack. 315, one meal and a snack. 
copy that and to read back, we have five bottles from 203, four bottles from 207, one meal and one snack from locations 305, 313, 307, and 315. Coffee. Thank you. As you just heard, Saudi Space Commission astronaut Rayana Barnawi reporting out the inventory aboard Crew Dragon. Everything is meticulously tracked aboard the space station in Dragon as well. So she was reporting uh, which meals and snacks had been consumed during their 16, approximate 16 hour flight from uh, launch last night at 5.37 p.m. Eastern Time to docking this morning at 9.12 a.m. Eastern Time.
Again, you're watching live coverage of the AX-2 arrival at the International Space Station, the second private astronaut mission to visit the space station following the Axiom-1 flight last year. Currently aboard Dragon Freedom, which you see on your screen, attached to the station's Node 2 Zenith port are Commander Peggy Whitson, Pilot John Schaffner, and Mission Specialists Ali Alkarni and Rihanna Barnawi. On the space station side, NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg is working to pressurize and the... SpaceX on the big loop for procedure 4.400. Four decimal four hundred. Hey, so we're getting close to finishing the leak check, but you have a go to perform section five for the dock waste system configuration. Okay, go for section five. We'll try and get all the other activities out of the way first and get that in march. Copy all. We heard Peggy Whitson earlier say that the crew has doffed their suits. They are now in probably their flight suits ahead of heading into the International Space Station. We're expecting that around 10 a.m. Central Time for those hatches to open. Uh, they are drying their suits currently, just keeping them in good shape ahead of a trip home. Uh, they're planning on about an eight-day stay aboard the International Space Station. However, several things can affect that departure date, uh, mainly the weather at the landing location. SpaceX has a number of select landing locations off the coast of Florida. And we watch for things like wave height or um, wave cadence, as well as wind speeds, to ensure that the crew have the safest and most comfortable landing possible.
Station Houston on the big loop. We have a good leak check. ISS is going to complete vestibule equalization and open the A-pass hatch at step 3.1 of procedure 2.102. Right, station copies go in three decimal one. For those of you just joining our coverage of Axiom 2 uh, crew in our SpaceX Dragon Freedom capsule, which is what you see there on your screen, has successfully docked to the International Space Station. In fact, we had a new record time for uh, SpaceX operations. We actually beat the Crew 4 um, record from uh, liftoff to soft capture, our record time now is about 15 hours and 35 minutes from liftoff to soft capture. So uh, basically the most efficient and fastest uh, transit to the International Space Station from pad 39A. That's a beautiful view there of that Dragon Freedom capsule. This is docked at the Node 2 Zenith port. The Crew-6 capsule, until uh, about a couple weeks ago, was docked to this same port, and we did a port relocation maneuver with the Crew-6 crew to move it down to the Node 2 forward port. By doing so, we were able to clear this Zenith port for the AX-2 mission, as well as the upcoming CRS-28 cargo resupply mission. Although it might look stagnant if you look at it quickly, we can see planet Earth rotating slowly behind, or rather under, the Dragon capsule and the International Space Station. There at the bottom of the screen, you can uh, kind of make out the Canada arm, which is the robotic arm that the crew on board station will utilize in order to remove cargo from the unpressurized section of Dragon located in the trunk, which is essentially the uh, top half, in this orientation, the top half of the Dragon capsule. Of course, when we are sitting at the launch pad or other conventional views of Dragon, it's the bottom half of Dragon. Um, but really, it's that half black, half white cylindrical portion of Dragon that we see there. This view is also great because you get a really clear view of the nose cone and all of the hardware that the nose cone protects during the, uh, the launch phase. Of course, we got some ambient noise here at SpaceX headquarters as our first shift operations are well underway. During the ascent phase, that nose cone will be closed and that protects the forward hatch as well as the forward bulkhead Draco thrusters.
So right now, the Axiom 2 crew, they have taken their suits off. We heard the call out earlier that the suits are drying. And uh, as you can see, the Dragon capsule is docked and um, they have completed pressurization of the, uh, the APAS hatch. So we uh, are making great progress, um, but uh, talking about the crew, let's get to learn a little bit more about them in case you may have missed our introductions earlier in the broadcast as we've been, <laughs> we've been going for a little <laughs> bit while. So let's learn more about, uh, more about the AX2 crew. Yeah, it's always good to get a little refresher on our AX2 crew here. The AX2 mission is commanded by retired NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson. Born and raised in Beaconsfield, Iowa, she was inspired along with the world when she watched the Apollo 11 crew walk on the moon. She has since become the most experienced American astronaut and one of the most decorated. Whitson flew three long duration missions to the ISS and has more cumulative time in space, 665 days, than any U.S. astronaut and more than any woman in the world. She has conducted 10 spacewalks with over 60 hours of time and has performed hundreds of research experiments on board the ISS. Not only is she the commander for this mission, but Peggy also serves as the director of human space flight for Axiom Space. The pilot for AX2 is private astronaut John Schaffner. Born in Alaska and raised in Kentucky, Schaffner is a STEAM education advocate, business pioneer, and lifelong space enthusiast. A pilot since the age of 17, John has over 8,500 flight hours holding commercial, instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings in land and sea aircraft, as well as helicopter. He also holds ratings in former military jets and high-performance radial engine aircraft. As an athlete, John has years of, exp uh, years of competitive experience in water skiing, cycling, whitewater kayaking, hang gliding, skydiving, and base jumping. John trained as the AX-1 backup pilot and during this mission on AX-2, plans to invest a lot of his time in STEAM education activities aimed at empowering educators and inspiring teachers. And representing the Saudi Space Commission and serving as a mission specialist, Ali Al Karni was born in March 1992 in Sabt Al Alea, Saudi Arabia. Ali is fluent in English as well as his native Arabic, and as an Air Force captain, has 12 years of experience flying on multiple aircraft, primarily on the F 15 SA in service to the Royal Saudi Air Force. Ali graduated with a Bachelor of Aerospace Science degree in 2013 from King Faisal Air Academy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Also representing the Saudi Space Commission and serving as a mission specialist, Rayana Barnawi, or as we hear her identify herself as Ray on comms, um, was born in September 1988 in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Rayana has a master's degree in biomedical sciences from Al Faisal University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and a bachelor's degree in biomedical sciences from Otago University in Dunedin, New Zealand. She is fluent in English and Turkish, as well as native Arabic. She has been a research lab technician since 2013 in the stem cell and tissue re-engineering program at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center and located in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And there they are, the AX2 crew. We are so excited for them to now be docked to the ISS and so proud that they've made it this far after all their training. This is a really wonderful moment to be celebrating their journey to space. Yeah, obviously Peggy, um, a NASA legend, has spent years training to go to space. Um, our three formerly space newbies, <laughs> now that they are up there and now docked to the International Space Station, can't really call them rookies anymore. Um, but yeah, all four of them have been training extensively for this mission, and it's so great to see that they get to use it now. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. And on those, uh, on those cards, you may have seen their patch on their flight suits. And since the beginning of the space race in the 1960s, a custom patch has been used to represent and identify individual missions and their crews. It's also a long-held custom that these crews influence or even outright design their own patches, injecting them with symbolism and personal elements to commemorate their journey. This crew has continued this long-standing tradition with their official AX2 mission patch, so let's take a look. The AX2 mission patch highlights the beauty of space. Hope for the future. Condensation on two, the patch hatch is open with negative condensation. Oh. 
That is great news. Houston copies. Sounds like a hatch open update. Okay, continuing on this patch. Uh, this patch highlights the beauty of space, hope for the future, and the important role of the ISS to unite the best aspects of humanity. Shown prominently are the mission name, AX2, the family names of the crew members, and the flags of the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the two nations represented on board today's flight. There are five shapes drawn as constellations, and these represent the crew's intention to focus on inspiration, education, and teaching through STEAM education initiatives. And so there's a constellation for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. The arched path leading from Earth to space is colored lavender, which is culturally significant in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, symbolizing hospitality. That arched path and color also reflect KSA's desire to be part of the space sector and position itself as a contributor to the global space community. Then, naturally, the space station is central to the image as the destination of this crew, while Earth is featured with prominent horizon lines symbolizing optimism, hope, and inspiration. Just as you see this mission patch worn by the crew on their flight suits, this patch is currently adorning the walls of Axiom Space's mission control in Houston and is placed in a position of honor everywhere this crew is being supported for the duration of their mission. As someone that is an engineer, but I have a, a background in music and theater and art, I, you know, have a personal appreciation for um, just how evident and apparent the emphasis on STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics. It's been a long morning. I think I got those letters in the right order. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so great to see all of that represented so strongly on the AX2 mission patch. I just, I love it. It's one of my favorite mission patches that, uh, that we've had. Now let's turn it back over to NASA's Leah Cheshire, who is standing by at uh, Mission Control Center at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, for an update on space station operations. Leah? Thanks, Kate and Duke. Yes, we are still here in International Space Station Flight Control Room at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, continuing to monitor the arrival of the AX2 crew and their eventual uh, welcome to the International Space Station. Again, we docked at 8.12 a.m. Central Time this morning, so a little over an hour ago to the Node 2 Zenith, or space-facing port, which is where you see the crew now. They are flying over the country of Chad, 256 miles above Earth. And uh, those calls you heard about the hatch, those are those are the uh, APAS hatch and the vestibule hatch. NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg is stepping through hatch procedures this morning. He's currently in the APAS hatch, um, and I looked it up to make sure to get it right for all of you. APAS stands for Androgynous Peripheral Assembly System. I think it's pretty clear why we call it uh, APAS, keep it short and sweet. But that hatch uh, has been opened. He is inside, and he um, is also has also opened the vestibule hatch. So the dragon hatch is not open yet. Uh, we've still got some things that we need to work through on the SpaceX side as well as on the NASA side to make sure that we're ready to welcome the AX2 crew members aboard.
after after launch yesterday at 5.37 p.m. Eastern Time, Dragon made its way to the International Space Station, conducting a series of burns and uh, checkpoints along the way. This view inside the International Space Station, you're getting a look at NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg. This is his first flight to the space station. He arrived as a member of Crew 6 earlier this year. He is preparing the uh, space station for entry of the AX2 crew. As you can see, he's working on some venting. Um, that tube will go from the space station into Dragon and kind of help equalize the um, and, and balance out the air and the mix of um, the air that's in the space station to what's currently in Dragon. Again, the Dragon hatch is not open yet. We are remaining live all the way through their welcome ceremony when we see the four crew members, Peggy Witts and John Schaffner, the Al Carney and Rihanna Barnawi float aboard the International Space Station for the start of their approximately eight day stay. While aboard the space station, the AX2 crew members are going to conduct a plethora of scientific research, as well as conduct STEAM outreach with uh, students and other educational organizations here on Earth. And again, they dock to the node to Zenith port. This is where the Crew-6 Dragon known as Endeavour, was docked just a few weeks ago. However, it was uh, moved from one hatch to the next. So we have two dragons both loop. docked to New York, too. is ready for dragon hatch equalization. Houston copies on the big loop. Uh, stand by for equalization. Expect to take three minutes. Uh, additionally, ground is a little bit behind on configurations. So expect a slight delay for hatch opening. Station copies. Dragon copies. As NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg gets things ready on the station side, uh, the AX2 crew is still aboard Dragon and they continue to have some uh, steps that they're working through as well. We heard Peggy Whitson discuss the suit drying that's going on, as well as uh, Rihanna Barnawi reported down some of the uh, consumables that had been used during the flight, including meals that were eaten. Everything is meticulously tracked aboard Dragon as well as aboard the International Space Station uh, to make sure that it can be accessed when needed. But we are moving along pretty smoothly this morning toward hatch opening. The International Space Station uses GMT as their time zone, so it's about 2.30, uh, 2.28 p.m. Pacific, or sorry, 2B specific aboard the International Space Station right now, so 
crew members are in the middle of their work day, uh, most of them taking Copy that, Peggy. Section 5 complete. Any deltas to inventory? Looking at our timeline, some of the crew members on the space station side are enjoying their midday meal. Of course, after floating aboard, we'll see the AX2 crew move into their welcome ceremony uh, where they get to spend a little time with the uh, other seven crew members on the International Space Station and discuss their initial reactions to being on orbit and visiting the orbiting laboratory. Afterward, they'll step into their safety briefing and make sure that everyone is um, aware of the location of any certain safety items aboard the International Space Station, as well as what to do in any event of a contingency. After the safety briefing, the crew dra or the Dragon Freedom astronauts, uh, the AX2 crew, will begin moving some of the cargo from Dragon into the International Space Station side. Dragon Houston on the big loop, big picture update uh, based on what we see for open ground and crew actions. We see that we're about 15 minutes out from hatch opening. Dragon copy, 15 minutes out. And station copies, one five minutes. Teams on the ground and teams on the space station continuing to step through their procedures, uh, working toward hatch opening in approximately 15 minutes. And Dragon Space on two features. for status. Go ahead, uh, SpaceX on two. 
Hey, I was just wondering, uh, do we have a change to inventory due to the waste system flush? And you have a change to what? Yeah, to our inventory for water bottles consumed. No, we actually planned for the change in inventory, but since then, I pulled out one more bottle <laughs> out of the same bag and nine that still had bottles left. Actually, maybe two more. John wants to grab one, too. And copy that. Uh, that's two bottles from which location? Two Copy that. Two bottles from 204. And uh, just checking in, are we able to come back on board with the cameras? Please. Copy that. We're about 10 minutes away from Dragon Hatch opening. International Space Station and Dragon are 261 statute miles over Kazakhstan, uh, about to enter into an orbital nighttime. Again, we see 16 sunrises and sunsets a day, so been anticipating another one of those in just a few minutes. You'll see some of the lighting change if we have views outside of the spacecraft. But again, we are tracking about 9.45 a.m. Central Time for Dragon Hatch opening. We'll see the AX2 crew members float into the capsule and then uh, begin the welcome ceremony. Again, we are in a Tedris handover, uh, meaning we do not have KU band. That is the uh, antenna we use to bring down our video from the International Space Station. So we are uh, anticipating the crew to float through the Dragon Hatch at about 9.45 a.m. Central Time. We anticipate having good video at that time, so we'll get to welcome those four crew members aboard and see their smiling faces now that they've arrived at the space station. On two, you can come on board. Copy that, Peggy. Bringing cameras back on board.
like dragging the first two suits to dry, but we're just going to hold on packing them until after the event, if that sounds right to you. Yeah, copy that, Peggy. Um, we'd recommend opening the hatch first and then possibly taking, uh, completing the task for stowing the suits um, before ingressing into ISS. Okay, copy, will do. This is a view of Mission Control Space at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. These teams have been monitoring uh, the flight of Dragon Freedom since launch yesterday afternoon, actually before launch yesterday afternoon. Uh, that launch coming at 5.37 p.m. Eastern Time from Florida. A flawless launch and then uh, about a 16-hour rendezvous to the International Space Station. We got into integrated operations earlier this morning once we crossed through the approach ellipsoid, a 4 by 2 by 2 kilometer invisible boundary around the space station that helps us govern uh, visiting spacecraft and their arrival and departure. Teams here in Mission Control Houston now on your screen are being led by Vincent Lacourt, flight director. They're working with astronauts aboard the International Space Station and staff this room 24-7, 365 to ensure that those astronauts and the space station systems remain supported. We've had continuous presence aboard the International Space Station for over 23 years now. And we'll be welcoming four crew members shortly as part of the AX-2 mission, the second private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. This view coming from their mission control, also here in Houston, Texas. They'll remain on console all week to monitor the status of the astronauts, as well as help them step through their uh, research payloads and any downlink opportunities that they have.
And we're expecting to regain video communications with the space station and Dragon shortly. Just a few moments from now, we'll see the AX2 crew float through the hatch and bring our total of crew members living on the space station to 11. Everything looking good ahead of hatch opening on both sides, the station and Dragon. We're just standing by to regain video communications before we go for that hatch open so we can ensure we'll see the smiling faces of our four new crew members joining the Expedition 69 crew on the International Space Station. Again, we expect them to stay for about a week before returning on Dragon Freedom back to Earth. And Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, S-band will be deactivated shortly. Dragon to ground will no longer be available for comms. Please verify PTT destinations are set to ISS. Welcome. Dragon Freedom. Teams in Hawthorne speaking with the crew still aboard Dragon Freedom, letting them know that uh, shortly they will not have the ability to communicate from or through the Dragon to Ground loop itself. However, they will start using the loops aboard the International Space Station to talk with teams here in Mission Control Houston, as well as in Hawthorne. Again, we are getting close to hatch opening, docking this morning occurring at 8.12 a.m. Central Time, so about an hour and a half ago. It was a very smooth ride to orbit yesterday, launching at 5.37 p.m. Eastern Time, and then again about a 16-hour transit, the fastest on record uh, for a Dragon crew to the International Space Station. Take a look inside Dragon Freedom as the crew members Space of Dragon Axiom 2. two. Um, we have all the suits stowed and seat procedure 40.12 complete. Copy all, Peggy. 4.012 complete.
Again, this view of the crew inside Dragon Freedom, our four astronauts uh, who have arrived as part of Axiom Mission 2, the second private mission to the International Space Station. Up in the center of the screen, uh, still sort of in her seat, that's uh, former NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson, the commander of this crew. Over near the window, you can see Ali al Karni representing the Saudi Space Commission. Down below him, uh, holding onto one of the footrests, is John Schaffner, the pilot. And just off camera, you can see her hand right now, that's Rayana Bernawi, also representing the Saudi Space Commission. We are standing by for hatch opening of Dragon Freedom.
again you're looking live inside dragon freedom as we prepare for the hatch to be opened and these four crew members to float into the international space station on what is the second private astronaut mission to the orbiting laboratory they will remain at the space station for about eight days before undocking and returning to earth while they're on board we will have a total of 11 people living and working aboard the space station Again, this crew launched at 5.37 p.m. Eastern Time yesterday, docking this morning at 9.12 a.m. Eastern Time. The hatches are configured to be open, so we are just standing by for that final go call to the crew. We'll remain on air through their welcome ceremony, where you get to hear some words from the crew themselves on their flight, as well as what they plan for this time on board. Afterwards, we will wrap our show as the crew steps into their safety briefings and eventually gets to work aboard the space station. Dragon SpaceX on two for hatch open. Dragon. Hey Peggy, so just big picture, following hatch open, we'd like you to complete part C of 2.102 prior to station ingress. We're still ahead of the timeline, so we've got some time to complete these tasks in the nominal sequence. With that, you are go for hatch opening per decal, followed by the remaining actions in procedure 4.400, section 6. Hatch open for decal and section C. That's affirmative, Peggy, and uh, section six of four decimal four hundred as well. Yes, copy. Section six of four decimal four hundred as well. Thank you. And we've got a view here in Dragon Freedom as Ali Alkarni works to open the dragon side of the hatch. On the other side of the dragon hatch is NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg waiting to welcome the crew on board after having completed all of the preparations this morning.
in Houston and SpaceX, Dragon Hatch is open. Houston copies. SpaceX copies. At 10 a.m. Central Time, the Dragon Hatch is open. Preparing to see our crew members float through and join the International Space Station. Houston, uh, the IMV uh, duct is installed and we are ready for IMV activation. Houston copies. Again, Dragon Hatch open at 10 a.m. Central Time after docking at 8.12 a.m. Central Time following their approximately 16-hour journey from the space coast of Florida to the International Space Station. In Houston sta uh, Station uh, in the Dragon, we're at 6.3. Ready for the um, procedures for the Lyle. Copy that, Peggy. Houston is checking. Dragon Houston on the big loop, you have a go for step six decimal three and procedure two dot one oh two. Go for six decimal three two dot one zero two. Thanks. Again, we are preparing for the 
AX2 crew to float through the Dragon Hatch and join the space station crew. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg, who has uh, monitored their arrival this morning, first in the cupola, and then worked to prepare these hatches, pressurizing the vestibule, that space between both hatches, and eventually assisting in opening uh, the APAS hatch, as well as then Ali Al Carney, just at 10 a.m. Central Time, five minutes ago, opening the Dragon Hatch. Again, this is live coverage of the arrival of the AX-2 crew to the International Space Station. We are just standing by for those crew members to make their way out of Dragon and into the space station. Moments from now. UAE astronaut Sultan Al-Nayadi just floating out of screen on the uh, right-hand side there. He has been working alongside Woody Hoberg this morning to prepare the hatches for the crew to float through, as well as monitoring their arrival. Both Hoberg and Al Nayadi arrived as part of the Crew 6 crew and are now both members of Expedition 69, living and working aboard the International Space Station. Teams are also preparing the inner module ventilation. That was the uh, tube that we saw earlier that Woody Hoberg was working with. They will route that from the station side into the Dragon side to help equalize the atmospheres between both Dragon and station. Currently, the International Space Station is flying 264 statute miles uh, southwest of Fiji. They are in an orbital nighttime, and here we have a great view of four of our crew members um, on the International Space Station. On the far left, that's NASA astronaut Steve Bowen. Down in the bottom left, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. Houston on two, uh, Lyo cartridge is sealed uh, per the detail at 15.08. Space NASA's Woody Hoberg was on the right of your screen and in the center, Sultan on the Yachty. Again, uh, preparations to egress Dragon continue. I, you can hear Commander Peggy Whitson discussing with teams on the ground that they are still stepping through those final checks.
26 Dragon for um, procedure. Do you want us to continue on step seven? Yes, yeah, affirmative on section step seven. Again, hatches between both Dragon and the International Space Station are open. Teams in Dragon, or the astronauts in Dragon, just continuing their uh, final checkouts before moving into the Space Station side, where and they will conduct their welcome uh, ceremony. Dragon on two, uh, we, all the valves are closed, including the PPRV ISO. Uh, SpaceX copies, thanks. Again, this is a view from inside node two, also known as Harmony. The uh, AX2 crew today docked to the Zenith or sp space facing port. There is another Dragon spacecraft docked to the forward facing port. Houston that is SpaceX, Dragon configuration is complete at step eight decimal nine of two one zero two. Houston copies. And SpaceX copies. This crew, uh, part of the seven that are on the International Space Station, patiently waiting their four new uh, crew members to arrive for the next eight days. Not pictured in this frame, there are also three Roscosmos cosmonauts on board, including Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Patelin, and Andrei Fedyaev. So with the addition of these four crew members about to float on the space station, we will have an 11 total astronauts on station.
and we have our first views of the Axiom crew members floating aboard. First is Commander Peggy Wilson rejoining the International Space Station. Next up is pilot John Schaffner making his first visit. Also on his first trip to space, you can see Ali Al Karni representing the Saudi Space Commission, all smiles as he floats through the Dragon Hatch. And rounding out the Axiom 2 crew, that's Rihanna Barnawi, also of the Saudi Space Commission. The crew of the space station is now 11 crew members. Big smiles from Rayana Barnawi. She is now the first female Saudi to go to space. With Commander Peggy Whitson at the helm, these astronauts are in good hands. Peggy has 665 days already lived in space. She's just adding to that total on this mission. John Schaffner, his first trip to space. Getting some help out from Woody Hoberg, NASA astronaut, who is also on his first trip to space. He's been on the space station now for 81 days. Again, the total number of astronauts and cosmonauts on board the International Space Station now at 11. Three of the astronauts on the space station represent NASA, three represent Roscosmos, two represent the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, one represents the United Arab Emirates. Again, we are standing by for the start of the welcome ceremony. The crew will take some time to do some scene and voice checks and make sure that uh, their microphones are set up properly, as well as that we have them all in frame before going into their welcome remarks. And of course, afterward, we will wrap our coverage before they step into uh, their work and life aboard the International Space Station for the next eight days. Station Houston on two for Frank and PIO. Hey, Frank, I uh, just want to tag up with you on the PAO event. Uh, we're thinking about doing a scene and voice in about seven minutes from now. Uh, will that work for you? 
That'll be perfect. Uh, we will call you back in about, uh, and we can even do five minutes if you guys want, but we'll call you back in seven minutes. Copy that. Uh, we prefer closer to seven minutes as we have a handover in about five minutes from now. Sounds great. As you heard the Capcom relay to NASA astronaut Frank Rubio, we are expecting a handover. We're expecting that short handover in just a few minutes. Um, we want to make sure that we have great audio and video from our visiting astronauts. So we are holding for that short handover and then we will start the welcome ceremony. Again, crew arrived this morning at 8.12 a.m. Central Time, the Dragon Hatch opening at 10 a.m. Central Time, and then crew members floating aboard just moments ago. Ali Al Karni, it looks like he already has the hang of things on his first flight to space. The Axiom crew has trained for months in preparation for this mission. The Axiom crew has been training for months in preparation for this mission here at Johnson Space Center as well as at SpaceX, working with teams on uh, the research that they will be conducting as well as learning space station systems. Three countries represented here. We've got uh, Tan Al Nayadi of UAE, two Roscosmos cosmonauts, as well as our two new uh, astronauts representing the Saudi Space Commission on their uh, eight day stay on the International Space Station. Just above uh, Barnawi and Al Karni's heads, you can see the two EMUs, extravehicular mobility units, used by USOS astronauts on spacewalks. Those have been moved from the airlock to allow a little more space for uh, the, Ash the Axiom crew um, during this flight. Of course, we do have 11 crew members on board now, so we have to make some room for sleep spaces.
And again, we are standing by anticipating a satellite handover uh, here momentarily. Once we've regained communications, we'll go through some voice checks with the astronauts. And there it is, as expected, uh, that handover from our satellites. We'll do those scene and voice checks when we come back to make sure that we have a picture-perfect view of the crew members before they give us some welcome remarks. This view from International Space Station Flight Control Room here in Houston, Texas. Teams continue to monitor the arrival of our four new visitors, as well as all of the systems aboard the International Space Station and the astronauts and cosmonauts that live there. Just over two hours now since the AX-2 crew arrived to the Zenith or space facing port on the Harmony module, also known as Node 2, that docking coming at 8.12 a.m. Central Time, hatch opening about 26 minutes ago, 10 a.m. Central Time. So we should regain that uh, video and audio communication with the space station momentarily. And Houston Station on two for senior voice check. Hey, Frank, uh, we are ready for scene and voice whenever you guys are ready. And as a reminder, you'll be on the handheld mic for today's event. Okay, sounds good. And uh, let us know if that scene works for you. And then I can do the countdown whenever you're ready. Frank, if you wouldn't mind, if you could gather everybody into their spots, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the scene once everyone's in place. Crew members begin to move into their locations for the welcome ceremony. Obviously, we have regained communications through the tracking data and relay satellite systems. Hey, Woody, we just want to get everyone to everyone into position before we uh, do our scene check. All right, we copy. We'll group up. Like I said earlier, looking at a pretty full house here aboard the International Space Station. We have the crew that uh, will fly on Soyuz MS-23 to return home later this year, as well as the crew that arrived on Crew-6, and now the AX-2 crew. Frank, uh, Houston on two, good scene check. We didn't hear audio on the handheld mic. Can you check the switch position?
Frank, we're checking the config on the ground. Stand by. Frank, if you wouldn't mind, give us another long count. We needed to sync things up. Thanks, Frank. We're good on scene and voice. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. Please begin the welcome ceremony. Houston and SpaceX, congratulations on a beautiful launch and a beautiful docking. It is great to have new friends up here. And so on behalf of Expedition 69, uh, it's an honor to welcome our new crewmates. I'll pass it off to the ISS commander, Sergei Prokopiev. Welcome on board, uh, dear friends. Uh, this is uh, very nice uh, uh, to see you here. Expedition 69, uh, so glad to hear, uh, have you here uh, with us uh, on space uh, station. And uh, uh, we uh, looked forward to uh, you, your arrival here uh, at least one month and I uh, watched yesterday your amazing launch and uh, uh, this is uh, outstandable uh, returning uh, first stage of Falcon 9 uh, on the launch pad is uh, so grateful and uh, congratulations with the successful launch and uh, uh, your docking and um, as for me this is a very great honor uh, to work uh, next with Peggy Wilson uh, so ex <laughs> most experienced uh, and uh, uh, decorated astronaut uh, in the US uh, astronaut corps and uh, congratulations uh, new astronauts uh, Rihanna, John, Ali uh, and uh, uh, my uh, congratulations to all of us. Uh, we have uh, now uh, 11 person on the space station. <coughs> and uh, uh, my uh, big congratulations of Saudi uh, Space uh, Commission. Uh, and I'm sure you will have uh, a great achievement uh, in the future in your uh, space exploration. Uh, thank you so much and uh, welcome aboard. Thank you so much, Sergey. You left it on. Thank you so much. Uh, we really are excited to be here. Uh, it was a great launch, a great ride. We had a lot of fun on the way up, and uh, we're really excited to get a lot of work done up here. But it's it's uh, it's great for me to come back personally. It does feel like home. You might need some help though for a while. I could help <laughs> you <laughs> with some of these things. But uh, uh, it's. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be here and to see this place again. It means so much to me, and I think it's, it, it actually brings people together just by being here. So I wanted you to meet my crew, so I want each of them to talk a little bit about their objectives and why they're here and maybe a little bit about the ride. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> uh, hi, I, I'm, I'm John Schaffner, you know, I, <laughs> part of the AX2 crew. Uh, it's it's an honor to be here and make new friends in space. First time I've done that for sure. So, <laughs> you, yeah, I've been dreaming or working toward this since I was eight in a young astronauts club. You know, watching Gemini pilots do their things. So we had cardboard boxes pretending to be Gemini pilots. So you think be having that much time to prepare, I'd have some better words than this. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, having a chance to be here and uh, fly with this amazing uh, new crew. Uh, Ali and Ray, and of course with Peggy Whitson, the awesome Peggy Whitson, and to join Expedition 69 is a fabulous thing for me, for anyone to be able to do. I'm honored. 
I'd like to thank NASA for creating the opportunity uh, and opening the doors for private and commercial space exploration, uh, and also the ingenuity of uh, SpaceX and Axiom uh, and to develop the next level of space platforms and space access for everyone. Uh, I want to say thanks to my lovely wife for those magic words one day. She looked on the news and said, look, you can, you can finally go to space. <laughs> she was right. Thank you for that, Janine. Uh, otherwise, we look forward to some great work for STEM education outreach and some amazing science that we have going on up here, and I hope you guys will follow us. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. This is uh, Ariel Carney. Uh, if you just allow me to start speaking Arabic first. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa shukran. هذه الكلمتين هي اللي تصف شعوري هذه اللحظة الحمد لله بتيسير وفضله وصلنا إلى محطة الفضاء الدولية شكرا لحكامنا بقيادتهم وحكمتهم ونظرتهم في المستقبل وتطور البشرية شكرا لاهتمامهم بمجال الفضاء شكرا لأسرتي على الدعم اللامحدود اللي حظيت منهم شكرا لزوجتي وأهلي جميعا شكرا لهيئة السعودية للفضاء بتحقيق هذا الحلم للناس وقريبا إن شاء الله سينضمون لنا الكثير بإذن الله شكرا لناسا شكرا أكسيوم سبيسكس على هذه الفرصة كانت تجربة تجربة الإقلاع تجربة تاريخية تجربة سوف تخلد في ذاكرتي إلى الأبد وذاكرة اللي معي صراحة كان طاقم رحلة مميز جدا وإحنا هنا الآن من أجل القيام بالتجارب العلمية اللي فيها نفع إن شاء الله بشرية ونعود بنتائج جميلة إن شاء الله Thank you everybody for the great welcome. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here and meet all of you, as John said, making space friends. So I would, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to work alongside with you, all of you, and eager to to just share the your expertise with me and learn from you. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, um, thank you to our king and his crown prince for their support and trust in us. Thank you to the Saudi people because this mission is not just for me and Rihanna. This mission is all Saudi people with ambition and dreams. And and also you can dream big because uh, in in our country, uh, with the support we have, you will be. وصلنا بدعم الجميع هذه الرحلة ما تمثلني أنا لوحدي ولا تمثل بس طموحي بالعكس هي تمثل كل الوطن العربي تمثل كل السعوديين الحمد لله أن نحن جاتنا هذه الفرصة أن نحن فقط نقدر نوصل الآن لمحطة الفضاء الدولية لكن بعد كده عندنا أكيد طموحات أكبر وأكبر منها القمر منها المريخ لازم نستكشف الفضاء هذه هي فرصتنا زي ما تشوفوا دحين جنسيات كثيرة متجمعة في مكان واحد فالفضاء هو اللي يجمع كل هذه الجنسيات المختلفة بأفكارهم واستكشافاتهم معلوماتهم فالحمد لله أن احنا وصلنا هذه المرحلة مع هذا الفريق الجميل وصلنا الحمد لله بعد تدريب تقريبا عشر شهور فهذا التدريب قابلنا رواد فضاء سابقين قابلنا بيجي ويتسون قابلنا مدربين دربوا رواد آخرين في ناسا وفي جاكسا وفي إيسا وفي نفس الوقت التدريب اللي جهزوا أكسيوم واللي جهزوا سبيكتكس شعور انطلاق الصاروخ صراحة أنا دموعي ما قدرت توقف لأني حسيت أنه أخذتكم كلكم معايا هنا فالحمد لله على التمام والكمال الحمد لله على وجود قائدنا ذو الرؤية الطموحة سمو سيد الأمير محمد بن سلمان الحمد لله على وجوده والحمد لله على أنه قدرنا نحقق هذا الحلم وهذه أول خطوة ونستنى بعد كده بإذن الله أشخاص 
كثير يكونوا موجودين هنا من العالم العربي أجمع. So greetings from outer space. Um, I'm here not only representing myself but representing the hopes and dreams of everyone back home, everyone in the region. We are here gathering um, with different uh, cultures and, and, and with this international collaboration. This shows how space brings everyone together. It brings even different backgrounds. We are, some of us are doctors, some of us are researchers, engineers, and so on. Um, I'm very happy to be here representing uh, the dreams and hopes of everyone back home. And at the same time, I'm very glad that I've received uh, extensive training from um, trainers who have trained previous astronauts uh, and, uh, like NASA, JAXA, ESA, and SpaceX and Axiom. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you all for listening. Thank you for letting me share my feelings. and. I'm going to live this experience to the max. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, we all are excited for all of the new astronauts here, and we have a something special. Ray, would you hold this while I pin John? Oh, wow. <laughs> Give him his official astronaut pin. <laughs> John is the 598. Astronaut. Wow. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'm ready for clapping yet. <laughs> and okay. Ollie, I think it's up. Mike is off. Okay. So Ali is the 599th astronaut. Thank you. And our little Ray is 600. more than anything. Okay, here we go. All right. So thanks to inviting all of us up here and welcoming three new astronauts. <laughs> Okay, and that concludes the uh, ceremony. Thank you guys so much. Again, it really feels like the International Space Station up here. Uh, this is going to be an awesome week. We're all excited and uh, super happy to have you guys up here. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. And with completion of the welcome ceremony, another big welcome to the Axiom 2 crew, our second private astronaut mission crew to arrive at the International Space Station. We now have 11 people living and working on the International Space Station. Again, we're looking for those AX2 crew members to live and work on 
the orbiting lab for the next uh, eight days. Um, we saw docking this morning at 8.12 a.m. Central Time, 9.12 a.m. Eastern, and hatch opening from Dragon to the International Space Station at 10 Central, 11 Eastern. All of this following launch yesterday at 5.37 p.m. Eastern from Florida. It was a smooth ride uphill, approximately 16 hours ahead of that docking today. And again, now we are expecting these crew members to live and work on the space station for about eight days before beginning their journey home to Earth. So for future updates on NASA missions, as well as what you can expect from the AX2 crew on their return coverage, you can keep an eye on NASA.gov. But with that, that'll wrap us up here in Mission Control Houston, and I'm going to send it back to my friends at SpaceX. Thank you so much, Leah. Excellent coverage from Johnson Space Center, really following along with all the integrated operations that ultimately led us to what a touching, welcoming ceremony. Now with that, we are going to wrap up our live joint coverage of Peggy, John, Ali, and Rayana's arrival to the International Space Station. It's been an honor to support the AX2 mission thus far. We wish the Axiom crew a successful time on station, and we look forward to joining you when it's time to bring them back home. <laughs> Absolutely, and Kate, I just wanna say from launch to docking, it has been an absolute pleasure sharing this desk with you. <laughs> so thank you, spasiba, and shukran. Over the course of our crew's time on station, we will be providing daily mission updates from Axiom Mission Control to highlight the range of science research and STEAM education events the crew will be conducting over the course of their eight days on station. Be sure to visit axiomspace.com and follow the Axiom social media channels for real-time updates. And with that, on behalf of SpaceX, Axiom Space, and NASA, thank you all for tuning in to watch. See you soon.
station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. We are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, good morning. I have you loud and clear. How me? Loud and clear, thank you. Please stand by for opening remarks. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jorge Samanillo, Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Latino. Did you know that Latinos and Latinos have contributed to the long legacy of space exploration? Franklin Shang Diaz and Elena Shoah were the first Latino and Latinos to go to space. Diana Trujillo, Cristina Hernandez, and Clara O'Farrell helped lead the Mars Perseverance rover team. And Frank Rubio continues that legacy on the International Space Station. We're excited to collaborate with NASA and have many questions, but let's get started. Hi, my name is Malachi, and my question is, what is it like being in microgravity? Hey, Malachi. Uh, you know, being in microgravity is a lot of fun, uh, mostly because you get to float around. So you can float up and back down really easily. Uh, you can stand sideways and answer questions like this. Uh, so it just makes it a lot more fun and a very interesting uh, environment to work in. Hi, my name is Ben. And my question is, how do you not get too hot or too cold in the spacesuit? Hey, Ben, you know, that's a great question. And our spacesuit is really an engineering marvel. It's basically a personal little spacecraft. Uh, it keeps you pressurized in the vacuum of space. It provides you with oxygen. It cleans out the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. And it also keeps you comfortable. Uh, we provide our own heat because when we're working out there, your body produces a lot of heat. And inside of the spacesuit, uh, you can stay really warm. And so sometimes you, ha you need uh, cooling. And we have what's called a liquid cooling uh, and ventilation garment. And that's basically something that you wear right over your body and underneath the spacesuit. And it uses water that flows over a sublimator plate. And so this plate is essentially exposed to vacuum. And we run water over that. And the sublimating water provides cooling uh, for the water that's running through your LCVG. And that's how we stay cool out there. The, the nice thing is that we have a small little controller that we use, and we can control our own temperature and make ourselves either warmer or colder as needed while we're out doing spacewalks. Hi, my name is Caleb Watley, and my question is, have you encountered an asteroid? Hey, Caleb, you know what? Unfortunately, we have not encountered an asteroid, but actually I should say fortunately, because at this orbit, uh, we're only 250 miles above the Earth. And so if we were um, to encounter an asteroid at this altitude, it would mean, uh, likely mean that it's about to strike the Earth or that it's a near miss. So it's probably a really good thing that we haven't encountered an asteroid on the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Fernanda Singer, and my question is, what are the benefits of doing medical research instead of doing it on Earth? Hey, Fernanda. You know, that's a great question, especially for me as a doctor, uh, because we can really study some pretty cool things up here and develop some pretty cool technology. One of the things that we do is uh, look at the way proteins develop in microgravity. Uh, because of the lack of gravity and other forces like convection or settling, uh, we can form really high quality crystals. And someday we can use those uh, crystal structures to make better medicines to help all of humanity back on Earth. Uh, the other thing that we see up here is that microgravity and the radiation environment that we uh, are exposed to up here has uh, very similar effects to some of the things that we see in the process of aging, like uh, bone density loss or muscle density loss. Uh, but those processes happen much faster up here in space. And so by studying them up here, we can hopefully find uh, ways to better deal with them back on Earth and help uh, all of our population. Hi, my name is Hector Emanuel Venzor Marquez. My question is, what is the most difficult thing to do in space? 
Hey, Hector. Well, actually, back to the previous question about bone density loss and muscle density loss. And so the most strenuous thing we do most days is actually work out. Uh, we do a lot of resistance exercise, and we use that to keep our bones uh, and our muscles strong. Uh, but probably the hardest thing that we do is our spacewalks. Uh, we're out there for anywhere for six to eight hours, and the spacesuit, even though it doesn't weigh a lot, still has a lot of mass, and so it's really hard to move. Uh, but uh, the views that you get to experience out there and the fun job that you get to do and being part of the, some of the amazing things that we work, work on as a team uh, make it all very worthwhile. Hello, my name is Genesis Coelho, and my question is, does space have a certain smell or taste? Hey, Genesis. Uh, you know, actually, some people say that when a spacecraft docks to the International Space Station, there's a very peculiar smell. And that's because, we think, because of some of the uh, ionized uh, metal reactions that happen with uh, metal that's exposed to the environment of space and it kind of smells like burnt chicken. Uh, but otherwise, everything else here on the space station smells pretty much like it does back on Earth. Uh, when we cook our food or make our food, uh, it smells just like what we have back on Earth. And uh, yeah, it's really, uh, it smells like uh, our home. Hi, my name is Jorge Reino, and my question is, you have to be in good shape to be selected as an astronaut. So what exercises can you do to stay in good shape while on the International Space Station? Hey, Ford, like I said, uh, being in good shape actually really helps you uh, to both function up here on the International Space Station and also when you return to Earth, have a higher level of function uh, sooner if you stay in pretty good shape. And so up here we do a lot of resistance exercise on a machine called ARED, and it uses two vacuum uh, cylinders to provide resistance uh, because we really can't lift weights, right? We're in microgravity, and so it would be way too easy if we just try to lift weights. Uh, and so we use that resistance uh, to simulate lifting weights back on Earth. And then we also have a stationary bike. Uh, the fun thing about that uh, stationary bike, with, which is called Cebus, is that it doesn't have a seat. And that's because we don't need to support our upper body because we're just kind of floating there. And so we just clip into the pedals and uh, pedal like a normal bike minus the seat. And uh, you get a really good workout there. We also have a treadmill, uh, but like I said, anytime you move up here, you tend to bounce a lot. And so to keep us down on the treadmill, we use a harness and really strong bungees to keep us clipped uh, to the frame of the treadmill. And as we run, that harness and bungee uh, keeps us grounded, and we're able to get a really good workout there too. Hi, my name is Eileen Sanchez. My question is, can you demonstrate a flip and tell us how hard it is to do, in, to do that space? Hey, Eileen. Yeah, like, like I said, uh, moving up here in space is a lot of fun. So you can do fun things like a pirouette. Or you can do a flip. Now, I'm not very good at flips, but we're going to try one. And the key is that you have to choose, um, control your up and down motion while you flip. So let's try it. And you can see, I put a little bit too upward uh, motion uh, for my flip, but I got back okay. Hi, my name is Mariana Orellana, and I have a question. Tell us a time when being in space was life-changing or very inspiring, and how that changed your view of space travel and the value of scientific research. Hey, Mariana, you know, I think the entire uh, experience of being on the International Space Station, of launching on a rocket, of getting to do spacewalks, uh, all those things have been incredibly inspiring uh, to me personally. One of the things that actually inspires me the most is actually looking down on our beautiful planet every day. Uh, we get to look out this window and see the beautiful uh, and mesmerizing colors that make up our Earth. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. And so uh, what it, it has inspired in me is a love for our planet, and making sure that I um, do my best to take care of it so that my kids and my grandkids can hopefully enjoy the same beauty that I've been able to enjoy. Hi, my name is Eric Silas Hinojosa, 
And my question is, what does it feel like when you go up to space? Hey, Eric, uh, you know what? When you launch in that rocket, it is a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, there's a lot of power because rocket fuel um, gets you going really fast, really quick. Uh, and it's pretty neat to go from zero to over 15,000 miles an hour in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and so it was pretty exhilarating, a lot of fun. Um, and you know, the, the, the cool thing was that I wasn't nearly as nervous as I thought I would be. And that's because I had excellent training. I have um, excellent training teams that prepare you for all of this. And so once you're in the rocket, your training kicks in and you're focused on making sure that everything's going right. And even when you get up to uh, the space station, you feel like you're walking into your home because you've trained so well. And so uh, overall, it's been an incredibly cool and fun experience. Hi, my name is Suyemi Cortez Cardenas, and my question is, how is training different between men and women? Hey, Suyemi, uh, you know, the cool thing is that the training is uh, pretty much exactly the same, and that's because we have some incredibly capable men and women uh, in the astronaut corps, and so I have the pleasure of working some, with some incredible women who are just as capable and just as uh, able, if not more so in a lot of ways, uh, than I am. Uh, which is really cool because as a father of four, and three of my kids are daughters, it's really neat that they can uh, not only look up to their mother, but also look up to all these amazing women that I get to work with and um, use them as role models. Hi, my name is Nelson Solano, and my question to you is, when you were an astronaut, what was your first day on the job like? Hey, Nelson, uh, you know, that first day on the job just really felt like a big dream. Uh, it was really a dream come true to become an astronaut. I never thought I would be, to be honest. And so once you get selected, uh, you feel incredibly blessed, uh, incredibly humbled, uh, because, again, there's so many amazing people that try out, and any, any of them could make uh, incredible astronauts. And so um, it was a huge blessing, and you kind of feel like you're walking on a cloud uh, for the first several hundred days, to be honest. Uh, but that first day was really special. Uh, one of the most special things about it is that you actually get to meet uh, the other people that you're going to be working with for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and those are your classmates in your astronaut class. And they are uh, some pretty amazing people who have now become some of my best friends. And so being able to get to meet them was super exciting. And uh, having been able to work with them for the past six years has been an incredible experience. Hi, my name is Dominic Gazame, and my question is, what are some cool things you can do with water in space? Hey, Dominic, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I'll show you instead of telling you. So we have to drink a lot of water in space, and that's because um, it's really important to stay hydrated, both in space and on Earth. Now, without gravity, it can get kind of messy. So I'm going to make a bubble of water, and you're going to see that it's just going to kind of float in front of us. I have a towel with me because it can, it, it can get kind of messy. And as you can see, we have a lot of electronics, so we don't want water just floating around the space station. Now, the cool thing is it would just sit here and float all day, but we do have a lot of airflow uh, to make sure that our air stays pure. And so you'll see it floating away in the airflow. But if I blow just right, you can affect which way the bubble goes. All right, hopefully you got to enjoy that. Let's drink it up. Hi, my name is Melissa Moreno. My question is, in your opinion, what is the most mesmerizing thing you've seen in space from the space station?
Hey, Melissa. Uh, you know, the most mesmerizing thing that I've seen, I think, is really <clears throat> our beautiful planet, the Earth. Um, the colors are just so incredible. And it's also, uh, I think, from this perspective, it really gives you an appreciation for how much of our planet is covered in water. Uh, the, sp the Pacific Ocean, is especially, is just so vast. And even though we're flying at 17,500 miles an hour up here, it takes a long time to fly over the Pacific Ocean because it's so big. And so seeing all that water together, uh, seeing all the different shades of blue that make up the ocean has uh, really been a beautiful thing that I think I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. Hi, my name is Natalia Landaverde. My question is, what can I do to place myself on a path for a career that one day will allow me to live and work at the International Space Station? Hey, Natalia, we would love to have you and lots of other uh, talented young people up here on the International Space Station someday. Uh, and so to become a NASA astronaut, it's really uh, not that hard. One, you have to be a US citizen. Uh, we do want you to have studied in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, or math. Uh, and you can uh, have either a bachelor's or a master's degree in that field. Uh, and that's because uh, just uh, the whole space travel uh, and act of being an astronaut requires a lot of that mathematics and science background. But uh, the cool thing is you can get that background in lots of different jobs. We have engineers, we have scientists, uh, we have different types of pilots, both helicopter pilots and jet pilots. Uh, we have doctors, um, and we all make uh, great explorers. I think the number one thing that you really need to work on, though, is being a great team player. Uh, and the way to demonstrate that and all the other skills that you might bring as an astronaut is just to find a career that you love and that you can be passionate about, and then go out there and do your absolute best at that job. And then someday, uh, hopefully, NASA will say, hey, we need you to come up here and be an astronaut so that you can go explore space. Hello, my name is Michelle Oliver, and my question is, what is it like to continue the legacy of Latinos and Latinas in space exploration? Hey, Michelle, it is an incredible honor to be a Latino up here on the International Space Station. You know, Latinos have contributed so much to our country, both as scientists, engineers, as artists, as explorers, as athletes, our community just makes an incredible uh, contribution to our country every day. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things that we've brought is our culture. And we've brought our culture to the incredible uh, melting pot that is the American uh, culture. And that mix has just brought a lot of flavor and a lot of fun. Uh, and it, for me, it's uh, both incredibly humbling, a privilege, and an honor to be up here representing uh, our community. On behalf of the Latino Museum and everyone watching today, I want to thank NASA and the space station crew for answering our questions. We look forward to working with you again. Thanks so much, Jorge. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.
station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. We are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, good morning. I have you loud and clear. How me? Loud and clear, thank you. Please stand by for opening remarks. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jorge Samanillo, Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of America Latino. Did you know that Latinas and Latinos have contributed to the long legacy of space exploration? Franklin Shang Diaz and Elena Shoa were the first Latino and Latinos to go to space. Diana Trujillo, Cristina Hernandez, and Clara O'Farrell helped lead the Mars Perseverance rover team. And Frank Rubio continues that legacy on the International Space Station. We're excited to collaborate with NASA and have many questions, but let's get started. Hi, my name is Malachi, and my question is, what is it like being in microgravity? Hey, Malachi. Uh, you know, being in microgravity is a lot of fun, uh, mostly because you get to float around. So you can float up and back down really easily. Uh, you can stand sideways and answer questions like this. Uh, so it just makes it a lot more fun and a very interesting uh, environment to work in. Hi, my name is Ben. And my question is, how do you not get too hot or too cold in the spacesuit? Hey, Ben, you know, that's a great question. And our spacesuit is really an engineering marvel. It's basically a personal little spacecraft. Uh, it keeps you pressurized in the vacuum of space. It provides you with oxygen. It cleans out the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. And it also keeps you comfortable. Uh, we provide our own heat because when we're working out there, your body produces a lot of heat. And inside of the spacesuit, uh, you can stay really warm. And so sometimes you, ha you need uh, cooling. And we have what's called a liquid cooling uh, and ventilation garment. And that's basically something that you wear right over your body and underneath the spacesuit. And it uses water that flows over a sublimator plate. And so this plate is essentially exposed to vacuum. And we run water over that. And the sublimating water provides cooling uh, for the water that's running through your LCVG. And that's how we stay cool out there. The, the nice thing is that we have a small little controller that we use, and we can control our own temperature and make ourselves either warmer or colder as needed while we're out doing spacewalks. Hi, my name is Caleb Watley, and my question is, have you encountered an asteroid? Hey, Caleb. You know what? Unfortunately, we have not encountered an asteroid, but actually, I should say fortunately, because at this orbit, uh, we're only 250 miles above the Earth. And so if we were um, to encounter an asteroid at this altitude, it would mean, uh, likely mean that it's about to strike the Earth or that it's a near miss. So it's probably a really good thing that we haven't encountered an asteroid on the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Fernanda Singer, and my question is, what are the benefits of doing medical research instead of doing it on Earth? Hey, Fernanda. You know, that's a great question, especially for me as a doctor, uh, because we can really study some pretty cool things up here and develop some pretty cool technology. One of the things that we do is uh, look at the way proteins develop in microgravity. Uh, because of the lack of gravity and other forces like convection or settling, uh, we can form really high quality crystals. And someday we can use those uh, crystal structures to make better medicines to help all of humanity back on Earth. Uh, the other thing that we see up here is that microgravity and the radiation environment that we uh, are exposed to up here has uh, very similar effects to some of the things that we see in the process of aging, like uh, bone density loss or muscle density loss. Uh, but those processes happen much faster up here in space. And so by studying them up here, we can hopefully find uh, ways to better deal with them back on Earth and help uh, all of our population. Hi, my name is Hector Emanuel Venzor Marquez. My question is, what is the most difficult thing to do in space? 
Hey, Hector. Well, actually, back to the previous question about bone density loss and muscle density loss. And so the most strenuous thing we do most days is actually work out. Uh, we do a lot of resistance exercise, and we use that to keep our bones uh, and our muscles strong. Uh, but probably the hardest thing that we do is our spacewalks. Uh, we're out there for anywhere for six to eight hours, and the spacesuit, even though it doesn't weigh a lot, still has a lot of mass, and so it's really hard to move. Uh, but uh, the views that you get to experience out there and the fun job that you get to do and being part of the, some of the amazing things that we work, work on as a team uh, make it all very worthwhile. Hello, my name is Genesis Coelho, and my question is, does space have a certain smell or taste? Hey, Genesis. Uh, you know, actually, some people say that when a spacecraft docks to the International Space Station, there's a very peculiar smell. And that's because we think because of some of the uh, ionized uh, metal reactions that happen with uh, metal that's exposed to the environment of space. And it kind of smells like burnt chicken. Uh, but otherwise, everything else here on the space station smells pretty much like it does back our, on Earth. Uh, when we cook our food or make our food, uh, it smells just like what we have back on Earth. And uh, yeah, it's really, uh, it smells like uh, our home. Hi, my name is Fort Reino, and my question is, you have to be in good shape to be selected as an astronaut. So what exercises can you do to stay in good shape while on the International Space Station? Hey, Ford, like I said, uh, being in good shape actually really helps you uh, to both function up here on the International Space Station and also when you return to Earth, have a higher level of function uh, sooner if you stay in pretty good shape. And so up here we do a lot of resistance exercise on a machine called ARED, and it uses two vacuum uh, cylinders to provide resistance uh, because we really can't lift weights, right? We're in microgravity, and so it would be way too easy if we just try to lift weights. Uh, and so we use that resistance uh, to simulate lifting weights back on Earth. And then we also have a stationary bike. Uh, the fun thing about that uh, stationary bike, with, which is called Sevis, is that it doesn't have a seat. And that's because we don't need to support our upper body because we're just kind of floating there. And so we just clip into the pedals and uh, pedal like a normal bike, minus the seat. And uh, you get a really good workout there. We also have a treadmill. Uh, but like I said, anytime you move up here, you tend to bounce a lot. And so to keep us down on the treadmill, we use a harness and really strong bungees to keep us clipped uh, to the frame of the treadmill. And as we run, that harness and bungee uh, keeps us grounded, and we're able to get a really good workout there, too. Hi, my name is Irene Sanchez. My question is, can you demonstrate a flip and tell us how hard it is to do, in, to do that in space? Hey, Lean. Yeah, like, like I said, uh, moving up here in space is a lot of fun. So you can do fun things like a pirouette. Or you can do a flip. Now, I'm not very good at flips, but we're going to try one. And the key is that you have to choose, um, control your up and down motion while you flip. So let's try it. And you can see, I put a little bit too upward uh, motion uh, for my flip, but I got back okay. Hi, my name is Mariana Orellana, and I have a question. Tell us a time when being in space was life-changing or very inspiring, and how that changed your view of space travel and the value of scientific research. Hey, Mariana, you know, I think the entire uh, experience of being on the International Space Station, of launching on a rocket, of getting to do spacewalks, uh, all those things have been incredibly inspiring uh, to me personally. One of the things that actually inspires me the most is actually looking down on our beautiful planet every day. Uh, we get to look out this window and see the beautiful uh, and mesmerizing colors that make up our Earth. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. And so uh, what it, it has inspired in me is a love for our planet, and making sure that I um, do my best to take care of it so that my kids and my grandkids can hopefully enjoy the same beauty that I've been able to enjoy. Hi, my name is Eric Silas Enojosa, 
And my question is, what does it feel like when you go up to space? Hey, Eric, uh, you know what? When you launch in that rocket, it is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Uh, there's a lot of power because rocket fuel um, gets you going really fast, really quick. Uh, and it's pretty neat to go from zero to over 15,000 miles an hour in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and so it was pretty exhilarating, a lot of fun. Um, and you know, the, the, the cool thing was that I wasn't nearly as nervous as I thought I would be. And that's because I had excellent training. I have um, excellent training teams that prepare you for all of this. And so once you're in the rocket, your training kicks in and you're focused on making sure that everything's going right. And even when you get up to uh, the space station, you feel like you're walking into your home because you've trained so well. And so uh, overall, it's been an incredibly cool and fun experience. Hi, my name is Suyemi Cortez Cardenas, and my question is, how is training different between men and women? Hey, Suyemi, uh, you know, the cool thing is that the training is uh, pretty much exactly the same, and that's because we have some incredibly capable men and women uh, in the astronaut corps, and so I have the pleasure of working some, with some incredible women who are just as capable and just as uh, able, if not more so in a lot of ways, uh, than I am. Uh, which is really cool because as a father of four, and three of my kids are daughters, it's really neat that they can uh, not only look up to their mother, but also look up to all these amazing women that I get to work with and um, use them as role models. Hi, my name is Nelson Solano, and my question to you is, when you were an astronaut, what was your first day on the job like? Hey, Nelson, uh, you know, that first day on the job just really felt like a big dream. Uh, it was really a dream come true to become an astronaut. I never thought I would be, to be honest. And so once you get selected, uh, you feel incredibly blessed, uh, incredibly humbled, uh, because, again, there's so many amazing people that try out, and any, any of them could make uh, incredible astronauts. And so um, it was a huge blessing, and you kind of feel like you're walking on a cloud uh, for the first several hundred days, to be honest. Uh, but that first day was really special. Uh, one of the most special things about it is that you actually get to meet uh, the other people that you're going to be working with for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and those are your classmates in your astronaut class. And they are uh, some pretty amazing people who have now become some of my best friends. And so being able to get to meet them was super exciting. And uh, having been able to work with them for the past six years has been an incredible experience. Hi, my name is Dominic Gazame, and my question is, what are some cool things you can do with water in space? Hey, Dominic, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I'll show you instead of telling you. So we have to drink a lot of water in space, and that's because um, it's really important to stay hydrated, both in space and on Earth. Now, without gravity, it can get kind of messy. So I'm going to make a bubble of water, and you're going to see that it's just going to kind of float in front of us. I have a towel with me because it can, it, it can get kind of messy. And as you can see, we have a lot of electronics, so we don't want water just floating around the space station. Now, the cool thing is it would just sit here and float all day, but we do have a lot of airflow uh, to make sure that our air stays pure. And so you'll see it floating away in the airflow. But if I blow just right, you can affect which way the bubble goes. All right, hopefully you got to enjoy that. Let's drink it up. Hi, my name is Melissa Moreno. My question is, in your opinion, what is the most mesmerizing thing you've seen in space from in the space station?
Hey, Melissa. Uh, you know, the most mesmerizing thing that I've seen, I think, is really <clears throat> our beautiful planet, the Earth. Um, the colors are just so incredible. And it's also, uh, I think, from this perspective, it really gives you an appreciation for how much of our planet is covered in water. Uh, the, sp the Pacific Ocean, is especially, is just so vast. And even though we're flying at 17,500 miles an hour up here, it takes a long time to fly over the Pacific Ocean because it's so big. And so seeing all that water together, uh, seeing all the different shades of blue that make up the ocean has uh, really been a beautiful thing that I think I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. Hi, my name is Natalia Landaverde. My question is, what can I do to place myself on a path for a career that one day will allow me to live and work at the International Space Station? Hey, Natalia, we would love to have you and lots of other uh, talented young people up here on the International Space Station someday. Uh, and so to become a NASA astronaut, it's really uh, not that hard. One, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, we do want you to have studied in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, or math. Uh, and you can uh, have either a bachelor's or a master's degree in that field. Uh, and that's because uh, just uh, the whole space travel, uh, and act of being an astronaut requires a lot of that mathematics and science background. But uh, the cool thing is you can get that background in lots of different jobs. We have engineers, we have scientists, uh, we have different types of pilots, both helicopter pilots and jet pilots. Uh, we have doctors, um, and we all make uh, great explorers. I think the number one thing that you really need to work on, though, is being a great team player. Uh, and the way to demonstrate that and all the other skills that you might bring as an astronaut is just to find a career that you love and that you can be passionate about and then go out there and do your absolute best at that job and then someday uh, hopefully NASA will say, hey, we need you to come up here and be an astronaut so that you can go explore space. Hello, my name is Michelle Oliver and my question is, what is it like to continue the legacy of Latinos and Latinas in space exploration? Hey, Michelle, it is an incredible honor to be a Latino up here on the International Space Station. You know, Latinos have contributed so much to our country, both as scientists, engineers, as artists, as explorers, as athletes. Our community just makes an incredible uh, contribution to our country every day. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things that we've brought is our culture. And we've brought our culture to the incredible uh, melting pot that is the American uh, culture. And that mix has just brought a lot of flavor and a lot of fun. Uh, and it, for me, it's uh, both incredibly humbling, a privilege, and an honor to be up here representing uh, our community. On behalf of the Latino Museum and everyone watching today, I want to thank NASA and the space station crew for answering our questions. We look forward to working with you again. Thanks so much, Jorge. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.
station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston uh, station, we are ready for the event. MBRSC, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. MBRSC, how do you hear me? MBRC station, I got you loud and clear. Welcome, Saud. Sultan, we are here today in our dear partnered country in the Republic of Mauritius with the attendance of the acting president, Mr. Idi Bouassouidon. And uh, we are here with over 300 students as well. And we have uh, some students joining us from Rodriguez Island and some people connected with us from Agalaga. So we are here very, and we are here and we are very excited. Thank you, Saud. I'm really excited as well. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk to you people uh, in Mauritius. Uh, it's a great country and um, hopefully I'll get to visit uh, the country when I come back. And uh, I'm really happy to talk to you today and answer all the questions that you have. And let's start with this. You flag made into space. And hopefully when I come back, I'll give it to you in person. Thank you so much. Hello, Dr. Sultan. I'm Eddie Boissison, acting president of the Republic of Mauritius. It is an honor to speak to you live from Mauritius. This is a major step forward in our collaboration between Mauritius and MBRSC, further to develop our motion space initiative. I'm curious to know more about your recent spacewalk experience. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. And I think, um, as you mentioned, it's a great opportunity for uh, collaboration. Uh, space is a, a, a great frontier for explorations and uh, uh, spread your enthusiasm to uh, explore and learn uh, a lot our, uh, about our planet. And um, to, to, ask, or to answer your question, actually, the EVA was really, really interesting feeling for me. Um, it's the first time that happening uh, in the Arab world, so I felt like a great responsibility. So we spent seven hours outside of the station uh, to do a lot of uh, maintenance and preparation for installing uh, new so solar arrays uh, for, for power uh, uh, capabilities. So it's a re really great uh, honor to be presenting the country and the, the region and that EVA. And now we'll transition to get our one question from Rodriguez Island, and then we'll come back to Port Louis to continue the questions from the students here. Hello, my name is Enovan from Rodriguez. Could you enlighten us about how you get oxygen? Thank you. Very good question. So, as you know, the International Space Station is a great um, laboratory that orbiting the Earth. And we don't have um, a regular supply for oxygen from Earth. So we have to produce it here on board the station. So what we do is to um, um, use water and divide the, the uh, content of water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, and produce the oxygen that is necessary for our breathing on board the station. Hello, sir. I'm Ramesh. I would like to know how you get. I would like to know if your sensors are affected when you return to Earth. Thank you. Very good question. Of course. So, on board the International Space Station, we don't have any sensation for directions because our vestibular system is disconnected, literally. So. To you, you might see me inverted, but honestly, what I feel now that I'm looking uh, just like uh, a normal orientation for me. So it depends what you tell your brain and what you uh, uh, 
decide with your eyes what are the directions. So uh, when we come back, we need to uh, adapt again to uh, gravity because our vestibular system start to work again. So it takes up to two weeks to be back to normal 100%. Hi, I'm Priyanka. I would like to know what kind of food and drinks do you consume? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So we have a large variety of food. Most of our food is um, um, uh, dehydrated. So we have a, a packet like this and we fill it with water and we eat. We have other uh, types of food as well, which um, uh, comes in pouches and they're ready to eat. We just warm it in the food warmer and uh, we consume it normally. Um, our drinks come uh, in uh, these small bags. We fill it with water and we just drink it as, as we wish. So we have a variety of food on board the International Space Station. Hello, I'm Tikshita. I would like to know how do you sleep? Thank you. Sleeping on board the International Space Station is really interesting. So um, I'm sleeping in this orientation. I have a sleep bag and I go inside this, that sleep bag and I just uh, zip uh, the sleep bag and just close my eyes. I don't have any sensation of, uh, of a need of a pillow or uh, a blanket or anything. So uh, that is my orientation. Other crew members sleep on the ceiling. So their orientation could be uh, something like this. So they sleep like this and to them uh, it depends what they tell their minds how uh, the orientation they're in so again uh, we don't have any sensation for orientation here on, on board the international space station and we sleep normally hello sir i'm kaveri i would like to know what is your daily routine on the iss thank you Thank you for the question. So we have almost 12 hours daily of, uh, of work, exercise, and doing science. So we wake up at uh, uh, 6.30, we do the hygiene, and then we have our breakfast. And then at 7.30, we start with a morning uh, brief for the uh, daily activity. And then we continue work up to uh, 7.30 in the evening, where we finish with another uh, debrief of the activities of the day. And this goes for uh, five days, five working days. And in the end uh, of the weekend, obviously, we have a, a time to rest as a crew. Hi, sir. I'm Demishta. I would like to know how is the ISS protected from space debris? Thank you. Very good question. So um, the ISS orbiting Earth at an altitude of 400 kilometers. And um, during this uh, motion, uh, it is susceptible to some sort of debris uh, or um, uh, floating items. So uh, luckily, we uh, can uh, monitor the larger items or uh, larger objects, and we can maneuver uh, and avoid these uh, small, uh, big uh, uh, piece of junks or, uh, or debris. But unfortunately, some uh, micro uh, meteorite uh, can uh, hit the station and um, that is difficult to avoid, but uh, still we are protected with a, a very hard body of the station. Yet, in case of an emergency, we are uh, uh, ready to uh, uh, react to any uh, emergency regarding a depress of the uh, environment inside that station. Hi, I'm Mihal. I would like to know how do you keep the notion of time in space? Thank you. Excellent question. So do you know that we have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day? It was really hard uh, for me to comprehend uh, this environment. So when we arrived, I, I kept uh, seeing uh, sunrise and sunset every 45 minutes. So it was really difficult for me. But what we use is actually uh, GMT time. And that is our reference for daily activities. Uh, when we wake up, uh, we do activities and we go to, to bed. Uh, uh, based on uh, uh, GMT time, Greenwich Mean Time. Hello, I'm Itisha, and my question for you, sir, is how do you keep yourself upright during a spacewalk? Thank you.
So during uh, the EVA, um, it, it was basically a similar sensation to what we have uh, here inside the station. So any orientation that you tell yourself, you'll be in that orientation. But just like what we have in the station, we have some marking for handrails, for racks, and uh, for uh, indications on the walls. So we have a deck, for example, here. We have forward, because this is the forward direction of the station. We have aft and we have overhead. Same thing uh, uh, outside of the station, we have handrails that can, uh, can tell us whether we are going port or starboard or zenith or nether. So it, it is um, sometimes hard to uh, uh, navigate, but with the help of the ground and looking at these uh, mile markers, we can uh, accomplish the job with no problems. Hello, I'm Shannon. My question to you is, what inspired you to become an astronaut? Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, I think the, uh, the biggest motivator for me is uh, the sense, or uh, loving the sense of exploration. And um, I wanted to be uh, a pilot when I was young. And obviously, when I was um, uh, a little kid, I was watching a lot of uh, space-themed uh, cartoons. So that, that was the, uh, the ignition of that dream. And when I, I grew up, I, I just kept uh, reading, uh, kept indulging myself with all sorts of information about space. So that dream uh, uh, continued with me until I uh, got the opportunity to be selected as an astronaut. Hello, I am Hassan, and I would like to know main challenges that you faced in space. Thank you. So uh, again, we are trained to um, uh, uh, react to any sort of emergency. Uh, on board the International Space Station, um, uh, we are uh, living in a closed environment. You see all the wires here, but we are capable of reacting to um, a fire, for example. And coming back to uh, space debris, if this hits the station, it can cause a, a leak in the um, closed uh, uh, volume of the space station. So we are also uh, trained uh, to react to that emergency as well. So we spend a lot of time uh, training with these emergencies as a crew to have the, uh, the uh, accurate response for any emergency. Hi, I'm Zafira. I would like to know what do you do in case of emergency? Thank you. Thanks so much. As I said, um, uh, we are trained to, uh, uh, we train actually for years to uh, uh, react and respond to any sort of emergency. So the main uh, types of emergencies on board the station is fire, uh, depressurization, and a, a leak of a toxic uh, spill. So all of these uh, can uh, cause a problem for the crew, but we have the right equipment and we have the right response to, to deal with all sorts of emergencies that I mentioned. Hello, I'm Chetna. I would like to know how, how it is, what was the most beautiful scenery from space? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. So um, probably the, the first sensation when I arrive here, as I mentioned, is the feel of time. Um, without a reference, it is difficult to understand whether it's morning or, or day, because you have 24 hours, which is what we used to on Earth, but we have 16 sunrises and 16 uh, sunsets. So that was the, uh, the mental challenge that I had when, when I got on board the International Space Station. But again, we synced our time to GMT time, and I think it went normally after that. Hello, sir. I'm Kavish. I would like to know how do you keep yourself mentally and physically fit on ISS? Thank you. So uh, let's start with physical uh, preparation. So every day we train for about two and a half hours. Um, it, it is a must. It's not optional. So we, we do that every day. So we need to keep uh, the muscles uh, density and the bone density. Um, uh, in a best in a good shape uh, before uh, we return and mentally actually we work as as a, as a team on board the station so we have a sensation of uh, living within a family um, the source uh, the, the the sense of camaraderie is is really something that we rely on to keep in uh, in, a, in a good mental health plus we keep uh, connecting with earth just like I'm doing with you guys today 
We talk to uh, our friends and families through emails and normal calls or video calls as well. Hello, sir. I'm Zahir. How will the science experiments on ISS benefit society? Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, here on board the station, we do a lot of science. We do a lot of uh, experiment that can help humanity on Earth. So uh, for the last two months, I've been working on a lot of experiments, and I recall working on heart tissues. So scientists uh, on the ground, they use us as astronauts, and we, we are their eyes, their ears, and, and hands to perform these experiments. So I, was, I, I saw some heart tissues beating in space, and it was incredible. So um, these tissues are uh, uh, receiving medication on board the station. And this can help us uh, develop some medication uh, for uh, heart diseases on, on Earth. Uh, we have some other um, experiments that I worked on is uh, the biofabrication. We actually can print uh, bio tissues that can help us in the future uh, 3D print organs and donate them to uh, people in need. Hi, my name is Gregory. I would like to know how close to reality is a simulated training program for astronauts. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So uh, we have a, a large building in Houston. Uh, it has a mock-up of the International Space Station. So we spend uh, days and, and weeks to, to train ourselves on these uh, mock-ups to uh, uh, perform daily routines and uh, conduct some sort of science. And for the EVA training, for example, we have a large pool. It's called the MBL, the, the Natural uh, Neutral Buoyancy Lab. We go there, we spend seven hours, just exactly what we did uh, last uh, uh, EVA. So we train uh, how to uh, translate and how to perform maintenance in the, uh, um, in the EVA uh, operations. So we have a very realistic uh, mock-ups and training facilities on the ground. Hi, I'm Maiva. And my question is, how does a launch in a rocket feel like? Thank you. The launch was really quick, actually. Uh, believe it or not, we were in, in space in less than nine minutes from launch to uh, uh, final insertion. So it felt uh, really quick, uh, a lot of vibration, uh, and then everything went uh, quiet, and that was the indication of us reaching space. It, it was incredible, actually. Uh, Sultan, the people of Mauritius would like to see the flag one more time and an ending message maybe from your side. Thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. This is the flag of Mauritius, making it all the way to space. And I was uh, really happy talking to you today and hopefully we'll have more opportunities to talk in the future. Station, this is Houston ACR, and that concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants from UAE and Mauritius Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.
This dragon is slowly approaching. We did hear a call for a crew hands off point. That is where uh, the spacecraft, when it's about two meters away from the docking port, um, and that means that any aborts uh, need to be initiated by Dragon's flight computer after that point rather than by the crew. Then the vehicle will stand by for initial contact and capture, and then will be followed by a series of events to hard dock Dragon to the new port. That's right, Jesse, and you can see that docking ring is extended. We'll report the uh, docking time at the time of physical contact and a confirmation of a soft dock inside five meters. Copy, five meters. Such a cool view here as Dragon approaches the new docking port. Three meters in closing. Two meters. Copy, two meters. Two meters, chop, or crew hands off point. One meter. Copy, one meter. Soft capture complete. I can chop using concurs. That docking time is 7.01 a.m. Central Time. Dragon and Station at the time of docking were 262 statute miles off the East Coast of the United States, just off the coast of South Carolina. The soft capture ring on Dragon, you can see, is retracting, pulling Dragon in physically to meet up with the international docking adapter. This maneuver sets Dragon up to um, position itself in such a way to start the hard capture sequence. Really the reverse of what we just saw for undocking from the Zenith port. We'll uh, attach uh, Dragon Endeavor by way of 12 hooks that secure uh, Dragon to the station, followed by extending an umbilical connection and allowing the transfer of power and data from the International Space Station to Dragon. Flight controller is tracking a good alignment as the soft capture ring retracts and pulls Dragon Endeavor in for the hard capture sequence. The alignment is good. That means the next step uh, will be to initiate that hard capture sequence. Again, 12 hooks and an umbilical.
station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. We are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, good morning. I have you loud and clear. How me? Loud and clear, thank you. Please stand by for opening remarks. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jorge Samanillo, Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of America Latino. Did you know that Latinos and Latinos have contributed to the long legacy of space exploration? Franklin Shang Diaz and Elena Shoa were the first Latino and Latinos to go to space. Diana Trujillo, Cristina Hernandez, and Clara O'Farrell helped lead the Mars Perseverance rover team. And Frank Rubio continues that legacy on the International Space Station. We're excited to collaborate with NASA and have many questions, but let's get started. Hi, my name is Malachi, and my question is, what is it like being in microgravity? Hey, Malachi. Uh, you know, being in microgravity is a lot of fun, uh, mostly because you get to float around. So you can float up and back down really easily. Uh, you can stand sideways and answer questions like this. Uh, so it just makes it a lot more fun and a very interesting uh, environment to work in. Hi, my name is Ben. And my question is, how do you not get too hot or too cold in the spacesuit? Hey, Ben. You know, that's a great question. And our spacesuit is really an engineering marvel. It's basically a personal little spacecraft. Uh, it keeps you pressurized in the vacuum of space. It provides you with oxygen. It cleans out the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. And it also keeps you comfortable. Uh, we provide our own heat because when we're working out there, your body produces a lot of heat. And inside of the spacesuit, uh, you can stay really warm. And so sometimes you, ha you need uh, cooling. And we have what's called a liquid cooling uh, and ventilation garment. And that's basically something that you wear right over your body and underneath the spacesuit. And it uses water that flows over a sublimator plate. And so this plate is essentially exposed to vacuum. And we run water over that. And the sublimating water provides cooling uh, for the water that's running through your LCVG. And that's how we stay cool out there. The, the nice thing is that we have a small little controller that we use, and we can control our own temperature and make ourselves either warmer or colder as needed while we're out doing spacewalks. Hi, my name is Kayla Wadley, and my question is, have you encountered an asteroid? Hey, Caleb, you know what? Unfortunately, we have not encountered an asteroid, but actually I should say fortunately, because at this orbit, uh, we're only 250 miles above the Earth. And so if we were um, to encounter an asteroid at this altitude, it would mean, uh, likely mean that it's about to strike the Earth or that it's a near miss. So it's probably a really good thing that we haven't encountered an asteroid on the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Fernanda Singer, and my question is, what are the benefits of doing medical research instead of doing it on Earth? Hey, Fernanda. You know, that's a great question, especially for me as a doctor, uh, because we can really study some pretty cool things up here and develop some pretty cool technology. One of the things that we do is uh, look at the way proteins develop in microgravity. Uh, because of the lack of gravity and other forces like convection or settling, uh, we can form really high quality crystals. And someday we can use those uh, crystal structures to make better medicines to help all of humanity back on Earth. Uh, the other thing that we see up here is that microgravity and the radiation environment that we uh, are exposed to up here has uh, very similar effects to some of the things that we see in the process of aging, like uh, bone density loss or muscle density loss. Uh, but those processes happen much faster up here in space. And so by studying them up here, we can hopefully find uh, ways to better deal with them back on Earth and help uh, all of our population. Hi, my name is Hector Emanuel Venzor Marquez. My question is, what is the most difficult thing to do in space? 
Hey, Hector. Well, actually, back to the previous question about bone density loss and muscle density loss. And so the most strenuous thing we do most days is actually work out. Uh, we do a lot of resistance exercise, and we use that to keep our bones uh, and our muscles strong. Uh, but probably the hardest thing that we do is our spacewalks. Uh, we're out there for anywhere for six to eight hours, and the spacesuit, even though it doesn't weigh a lot, still has a lot of mass, and so it's really hard to move. Uh, but uh, the views that you get to experience out there and the fun job that you get to do and being part of the, some of the amazing things that we work, work on as a team uh, make it all very worthwhile. Hello, my name is Genesis Coelho, and my question is, does space have a certain smell or taste? Hey, Genesis. Uh, you know, actually, some people say that when a spacecraft docks to the International Space Station, there's a very peculiar smell. And that's because, we think, because of some of the uh, ionized uh, metal reactions that happen with uh, metal that's exposed to the environment of space. And it kind of smells like burnt chicken. Uh, but otherwise, everything else here on the space station smells pretty much like it does back our, on Earth. Uh, when we cook our food or make our food, uh, it smells just like what we have back on Earth. And uh, yeah, it's really, uh, it smells like uh, our home. Hi, my name is Fort Reino, and my question is, you have to be in good shape to be selected as an astronaut. So what exercises can you do to stay in good shape while on the International Space Station? Hey, Ford, like I said, uh, being in good shape actually really helps you uh, to both function up here on the International Space Station and also when you return to Earth, have a higher level of function uh, sooner if you stay in pretty good shape. And so up here we do a lot of resistance exercise on a machine called ARED, and it uses two vacuum uh, cylinders to provide resistance uh, because we really can't lift weights, right? We're in microgravity, and so it would be way too easy if we just try to lift weights. Uh, and so we use that resistance uh, to simulate lifting weights back on Earth. And then we also have a stationary bike. Uh, the fun thing about that uh, stationary bike, with, which is called Sevis, is that it doesn't have a seat. And that's because we don't need to support our upper body because we're just kind of floating there. And so we just clip into the pedals and uh, pedal like a normal bike minus the seat. And uh, you get a really good workout there. We also have a treadmill. Uh, but like I said, anytime you move up here, you tend to bounce a lot. And so to keep us down on the treadmill, we use a harness and really strong bungees to keep us clipped uh, to the frame of the treadmill. And as we run, that harness and bungee uh, keeps us grounded, and we're able to get a really good workout there, too. Hi, my name is Eileen Sanchez. My question is, can you demonstrate a flip and tell us how hard it is to do, in, to do that space? Hey, Lean. Yeah, like, like I said, uh, moving up here in space is a lot of fun. So you can do fun things like a pirouette. Or you can do a flip. Now, I'm not very good at flips, but we're going to try one. And the key is that you have to choose, um, control your up and down motion while you flip. So let's try it. And you can see, I put a little bit too upward uh, motion uh, for my flip, but I got back okay. Hi, my name is Mariana Orellana, and I have a question. Tell us a time when being in space was life-changing or very inspiring, and how that changed your view of space travel and the value of scientific research. Hey, Mariana, you know, I think the entire uh, experience of being on the International Space Station, of launching on a rocket, of getting to do spacewalks, uh, all those things have been incredibly inspiring uh, to me personally. One of the things that actually inspires me the most is actually looking down on our beautiful planet every day. Uh, we get to look out this window and see the beautiful uh, and mesmerizing colors that make up our Earth. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. And so uh, what it, it has inspired in me is a love for our planet, and making sure that I um, do my best to take care of it so that my kids and my grandkids can hopefully enjoy the same beauty that I've been able to enjoy. Hi, my name is Eric Silas Enojosa, 
And my question is, what does it feel like when you go up to space? Hey, Eric, uh, you know what? When you launch in that rocket, it is a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, there's a lot of power because rocket fuel um, gets you going really fast, really quick. Uh, and it's pretty neat to go from zero to over 15,000 miles an hour in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and so it was pretty exhilarating, a lot of fun. Um, and you know, the, the, the cool thing was that I wasn't nearly as nervous as I thought I would be. And that's because I had excellent training. I have um, excellent training teams that prepare you for all of this. And so once you're in the rocket, your training kicks in and you're focused on making sure that everything's going right. And even when you get up to uh, the space station, you feel like you're walking into your home because you've trained so well. And so uh, overall, it's been an incredibly cool and fun experience. Hi, my name is Suyemi Cortez Cardenas, and my question is, how is training different between men and women? Hey, Suyemi, uh, you know, the cool thing is that the training is uh, pretty much exactly the same, and that's because we have some incredibly capable men and women uh, in the astronaut corps, and so I have the pleasure of working some, with some incredible women who are just as capable and just as uh, able, if not more so in a lot of ways, uh, than I am. Uh, which is really cool because as a father of four, and three of my kids are daughters, it's really neat that they can uh, not only look up to their mother, but also look up to all these amazing women that I get to work with and um, use them as role models. Hi, my name is Nelson Solano, and my question to you is, when you were an astronaut, what was your first day on the job like? Hey, Nelson, uh, you know, that first day on the job just really felt like a big dream. Uh, it was really a dream come true to become an astronaut. I never thought I would be, to be honest. And so once you get selected, uh, you feel incredibly blessed, uh, incredibly humbled, uh, because, again, there's so many amazing people that try out, and any, any of them could make uh, incredible astronauts. And so um, it was a huge blessing, and you kind of feel like you're walking on a cloud uh, for the first several hundred days, to be honest. Uh, but that first day was really special. Uh, one of the most special things about it is that you actually get to meet uh, the other people that you're going to be working with for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and those are your classmates in your astronaut class. And they are uh, some pretty amazing people who have now become some of my best friends. And so being able to get to meet them was super exciting. And uh, having been able to work with them for the past six years has been an incredible experience. Hi, my name is Dama Gazame, and my question is, what are some cool things you can do with water in space? Hey, Dominic, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I'll show you instead of telling you. So we have to drink a lot of water in space, and that's because um, it's really important to stay hydrated, both in space and on Earth. Now, without gravity, it can get kind of messy. So I'm going to make a bubble of water, and you're going to see that it's just going to kind of...